Okay, am I tuned into whatever their name is? And then the rods will go whoop, open. And then while they're open, I'll say, show me no. And then they'll go, oh. And close again. <laughs> Okay, am I tuned in? Uh, I'm a human tuner. Say that you're counting one, two, three, one, five, six, one, and one, eleven, twelve, one, fourteen, fifteen, one, seventeen, eighteen, one, twenty, twenty-one, one, because four, seven, ten, thirteen, sixteen, nineteen, twenty-two, all reduced to one. Add infinitum. It never ends through this process. Every third number in the number line reduces to one. This 369 is like an expression of the Trinity in number. So if you went like you Google the term solfeggio and you know you land on Wikipedia, you'll get a page that talks about the hymn to St. John the Baptist from about a thousand years ago, where supposedly it was the first time notated in music the idea of do re mi fa so la ti was ever put forth. Uh, I don't really think that's the same thing. What's going on, Fire Tribe? Welcome to Rising from the Ashes. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. Isn't it so great to be existing in one way or another? In the here and the now, or the there and the then? The continuance of existence forever and always. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, today's conversation is great with our buddy Chance Garten from the Interverse podcast. We're going into a great presentation that he has ready for us on the Solfeggio scale. Uh, a bit, A bit of a deeper dive into the... Some of the science behind it and some of the numerology that goes into it. And it's beautiful. So this is a great conversation. Thank you guys again for tuning in. We are getting ready to gear up for our themed months of 2023. If you guys have been watching the Sunday Slow Burns on the YouTube channel, 
where we we give a lot more uh, current news updates and things like that. But we're going to be diving into the Celtic mysteries, the Irish history, the Northern European um, British Isles history, and all of that stuff for the first few months of the year. It's going to be a, a deep dive. And so strap in, get ready. Get ready to talk in Irish accents because it's going down. We are getting to the bottom of it. We are connecting ancient Ireland to ancient Egypt, and we are getting some answers to these questions that we have. And without further ado, some good old house cleaning, if you will, podcast style. You guys should definitely join the Telegram group chat. If you don't have Telegram on your device, I highly suggest it. Instagram, trash. Facebook, trash. The only thing on Facebook that's good is Facebook Marketplace. Everybody knows that. You buy and sell cars there. It's freaking sweet. But Telegram is a great platform, social media style, that's not so social media-y, you know? Um, And it's group chat. So we have a Rising from the Ashes page, and there's a bunch of amazing humans on there that participate in conversation we get the ball rolling we say things we share books we we share music we share stories and of course we share feelings it's amazing and i want to thank everybody on the telegram because you guys are awesome and you are my true friends i love it dan loves it too If you want to support us, please go and grab a subscription at Patreon. Check out the bonus content there. If you would like to buy yourself a sweet t-shirt or a backpack, a coffee mug, yoga mat, or a bucket hat, you can do that with the link in the description to the merch shop. Guess what? We got sweet designs. Yes, Dan has his very amazing and Dope design. Lost my train of thought. Grab yours with the link in the description and support Rising from the Ashes because it costs a little bit of money to do this, but we love to do it and we love you. So there we go. And of course, you should definitely get some psychic and clairvoyant work from our friend. At Vision Switch, Sabaya Sogard. She's been on this show before. You've heard me talk about her before. She is amazing. I have gotten past life readings from her, which literally made me cry while sitting on a stump on the hill behind my house. It was amazing. Um, I've had lots of psychic hygiene. She is my psychic hygiene practitioner, and I couldn't love her more. So that's why we promote her on the show. She's giving you guys a discount to her services. And I know that some of you have reached out to her and thank you guys so much. Her heart is full, as is mine. I hope that we can continue this forever because there's so much energy that gets trapped in our energy and energies commingle with each other. But you have to feel your own energy and not feel the pressing weight of others and it's a constant cycle you know it's a constant cycle to remember to ground down to clear everything out so that's why we have community to keep us here without further ado we're going to get into some rfta news now we don't have a special guest today but i do have a special book that i'm going to be reading from It's called The Sacred Plant Medicine, Explorations in the Practice of Indigenous Herbalism. And I'm going to read four passages about four plants with the four sacred directions, their associations. And I'll tell you what, this book is amazing, so I want to share it all with you. Here we go. I'm going to start with the Pasky Flower. An herb of the south. The botanical name for the pasky flower is Anemone patens or 
Pulsatila patents. The Dakotas call the call it Hokshi Chepka Wacha, the twin flower. The Lakotas call it Hoxi Kepsa, the child's navel. Blackfeet call it Old Man or Napi. Omaha and Ponca call it Little Buffalo Medicine, Te Zinga Makan. It was one of the sacred power medicines of the Omahas and the Poncas and esteemed very highly. Among the latter two tribes, the right to use the Pasque flower was limited to the medicine men of the Tessin Jens. The lilac colored Pasque flower is covered with a soft, hairy down, usually producing only one or two flowers from its small root. First and foremost, it is an herb to calm and soothe the, the nervous system. It is of the benefit when under extreme stress and overloaded with worry or feeling extremely angry or fearful. This herb soothes and calms and helps release tension. It is food for the nerves. It changes the energetic vibrations of the nervous impulses in the body to ones that are more childlike and happy and free from care, but in touch with caring and love. It is specific for use in ovarian pain and extremely good for neck and head pain ear and sinus pain. Though I have not found it to be true, many herbalists have reported that the fresh flowers can cause blistering to the skin on prolonged contact. Because of this, the plant was traditionally used as a counter irritant. That is, it is placed on one part of the body, which, is, which it irritates and reduces inflammation or irritation in another part of the body. One such use is the treatment of swollen joints in the hands. Placed on the knuckles, it would irritate the skin but relieve swelling in the underlying joints. Large quantities of the tincture can cause vomiting when taken internally, and I have noticed feelings of nausea when taking more than 10 to 15 drops of the tincture in one hour. I have found this dosage of the tincture to be quite effective in helping alleviate extreme stress or acute pain. Because of the strength of this herb and the possible adverse side effects, it should be used with caution. In European tradition, the anemone flower was said to have sprung from the drops of blood of the Greek god Adonis, which fell as he lay dying. Adonis was beloved by Aphrodite, for his great beauty, and she begged that he allowed to live again. Zeus decreed that Adonis' time was to be divided between himself, Aphrodite on earth, and Persephone, the queen of the underworld. He was celebrated as a god of plants. His death and resurrection represents the seasonal growth of plants and the regeneration of nature. The Greek physician Pliny noted that the flower was named after the wind, Animos, because the flower opened only when the wind blew, and pasky flowers do, does tend to grow only in places where the wind blows. In the mountains around Boulder, Colorado, the pasky flower is the second flower of spring, coming after spring beauty. By the time the other flowers come up, the pasky flower has become like the head of white hair. To many people in many cultures, this plant represents the beginning of life in spring, the youth of humankind, and the full cycle of life in growing old. This plant has the effect when taking it as a medicine to calm and soothe and heal the nerves. The sensation is very similar to the feelings of childlikeness and youthfulness which are common in childhood. In the medicine wheel, it is an herb of the south, of the newness and springtime of life, an herb of youth. When an old Dakota first finds one of these flowers in the springtime, it reminds him of his childhood, when he wandered over the prairie hills at play as free from care and sorrow as the flowers and the birds. He sits down near the flower on the lap of Mother Earth, takes out his pipe and fills it with tobacco. 
Then he reverently holds the pipe toward the earth, then toward the sky, then toward the north, toward the east, the south, and the west. And after this, an act of silent invocation, he smokes. And while he smokes, he meditates upon the changing scenes of his lifetime, his joys, his sorrows, his hopes, his accomplishments, his disappointments, and the guidance which unseen powers have given him in bringing him thus far on the way. And he is encouraged to believe that he will be guided to the end. And after finishing his pipe, he rises and plucks a flower and carries it home to show his grandchildren, singing as he goes. The song of the twin flower, which he learned as a child, and which he now in turn teaches to his grandchildren. The song of the Pasquay flower. I wish to encourage the children of other flower nations now appearing all over the face of the earth. So while they awaken from sleeping and come up from the heart of the earth, I am standing here old and gray. Osha, an herb of the West. The botanical name for Osha is Langusticum porteri. Its use by bears is legendary among many cultures and is often referred to as bear medicine. The common Mexican term for the plant is chuchupate. Is said to be an ancient Aztec term meaning bear medicine. Early pioneers in Colorado called it Colorado cough root because of its effectiveness for that condition. Almost everybody just calls it OSHA. OSHA is one of the primary herbal medicines you can use if you live in the Rocky Mountain bioregion. It is limited to range to Mexico, Colorado, New Mexico, and portions of Utah and Wyoming. The plant possesses strong antiviral properties and should be used at the first minimal signs of flu or cold. It is extremely good for sore throats and bronchial inflammations and will soothe almost immediately. The tea powdered root or tincture is antibacterial and excellent on skin wounds to prevent infection. It is especially good in cough syrups. A simple syrup recommended by Michael Moore in Medicinal Plants of the Mountain West is a grounded root mixed with twice the amount of honey, steeped for one hour, then pressed out when cool. But in any cough syrup recipe is excellent. OSHA is also excellent for stomach indigestion. I have found it very useful for cramping and pain associated with the beginnings of ulceration in stomach or duodenum, like its relatives Angelica and cow parsnip, but its primary usefulness in disease is associated with its antiviral and antibacterial properties. The part of the plant used medicinally is its root. The seeds and leaves make an excellent culinary herb, similar to Cherville. This plant can be confused with a very poisonous one, poison hemlock. The primary way to tell the difference is the root itself. Osha's root is quite hairy and possesses a strong smell similar to celery. The inner pith is yellow and has a somewhat soapy feeling. But once you sit with this plant and get to know it, it is impossible to mistake it. Until then, it is important to be certain that what you have is Osha. You only get one mistake with hemlock. The plant's leaves look similar, somewhat like parsley. It can stand two or three feet tall and possess characteristics umbrella-like as its flower stalk and seed pod. Hence, its family name, Umbelliferia. 
and digging the roots a shovel is necessary. They can be stubborn, strong, and often grow in aspen groves among the aspen roots, which makes digging all the more difficult. OSHA is present in the mountains from about 7,000 feet on up. This is one of the few herbs you can dry in the sun without harming it. It will last for many years dried and will not rot because of the potent antibacterial and antiviral substances in the root. OSHA does not like to be domesticated and is hard, if not impossible, to grow under cultivation. It is a plant of the wild. OSHA is a plant of the West. The looks within place. This is not an herb that gives itself to others in a kind and caretaking manner. It is an herb for warriors, for those who must go into the darkness and face their own demons. It is primarily a male herb. Though, like all herbs, it is also useful for women. If you sit in meditation with Osha, do not make the mistake of focusing on its leaves and the flowers and seeds. Its life and power is in its root. The delicate leaves are misleading, so when you sit with it, let your mind travel down along its stem and under the ground where the Osha lives. There you will see it like a bear curled in its den. When you call on Osha to become your plant ally, you must have your own warrior energy available. You do not beg Osha to come and be with you. You ask it from a place of strength and power. When Osha knows you are a warrior, too, it will be with you and help you. For people who are struggling in their own internal demons, who are trying to develop their own warrior strength for those who fight with the darkness within. Them I give OSHA. You must be willing to become a person of passion and strong feeling to work with OSHA. You must allow your rage and power to come out, to draw the line in the sand and say no more, no farther. OSHA goes to the root of the matter. It is a plant that helps those who are going through the destructuring it understands the stripping away process necessary to deep transformation it is for those who struggle to learn the truce of the bear much of the energy of osha is bear energy bears respond to it as a kind of ursine catnip they will roll on it and cover themselves with its scent Males have been seen to dig up roots and offer them to females as part of courting. When a bear comes newly out of hibernation, it will eat osha if it can find it to cleanse its digestive system. The bear will chew the root into a watery paste, then spit it on its paws and wash its face with the herb. It will then spray the herb over its body. The herb possesses strong action against bodily parasites. How did the bears learn these things? No one knows, but the herbal knowledge of the bear is legendary in all cultures. The bear is considered a primary healing animal because it uses plants for its own healing. Any plant that is considered bear medicine is a primary and potent plant medicine. The bear is the archetype of the healing animal, and there are many stories about its healing power. There is one story about a village on Turtle Island a long time ago. An old man came to the village. He was covered with sores and he smelled. He was very ill. He had no possessions and no food. He came to the first lodge in the village and asked the people there, Will you help me? I need a place to stay and some food and I'm very hungry. The people drove him off, fearing he would infect their children. They did not want such an old and sick man in their lodge. The man then went from the lodge to lodge in the village and each time was driven off. Sick and in despair, the old man came to the last lodge in the village. It was set off a little from the others and sheltered under the branches of a great tree. The old man approached the lodge and called out, asking for help. A woman saw that he was sick and in need. She brought him into the lodge, fed him, and gave her a place to rest. 
He ate and sank onto the bed and fell into a deep sleep. The next day, the old man was much improved, but still too weak to go on. He ate what the woman gave him and rested. Upon walking the next day, however, he was much worse. The woman applied what knowledge of healing she had, but to no avail. Each day, the old man became sicker and sicker. At last, having exhausted her healing knowledge, the woman knew the man would die. And he knew it too, and lifted his hand and called her over. I was told in a dream from spirit, he said, that there is a certain plant that grows in the forest that can heal me. Spirit told me to tell you of it. The old man described it exactly, saying, go and fetch it. The woman went into the forest and found the plant growing where he had described it picked it with prayers and ceremony and returned. The old man told her then of prayers and ceremonies and preparation and how it was to be made into medicine. She did these things and the old man became well. Each day he grew stronger and stronger. But before too long he began to get ill again and the woman tried all her healing knowledge and again it was to no avail. The old man just got sicker. Then again, when he was on the point of death, he called her over and told her for the second dream that he had from spirit about a plant that could heal him. Again, she followed his instructions, and again he was healed. This happened over and over and over again for a year, and in the end, after taking the final plant into his body, the old man grew well. He did not get sick again, and eventually he rose from his bed and went to the door. He turned to the woman and said, Spirit told me that there was one in this village who was to be taught how to heal people. I was sent to find you and teach you all I know of healing, and I have done so. And turning once again, the old man went through the door of her lodge and into the light. The woman ran to the door and looked out, and as she saw the old man pass into the forest, he turned into a huge bear and walked on. And this way healing came to the people. As two shields, the Sioux medicine man noted, The bear is the only animal which is dreamed of as offering to give herbs for the healing of man. The bear is not afraid of either animals or men, and it is considered ill-tempered, and yet it is the only animal which has shown us this kindness. Therefore, the medicines received from the bear are supposed to be especially effective. Many songs of herbal healing came from the bear. Here is another song from the bear of the Sioux healer, Akute. Osha's taste and smell are very strong. Pick its hairy root and feel its power. Taste a bit of it. Its taste will explode in your mouth and fill your body. It is a good herb to carry with you in the medicine pouch. Usnea, an herb of the north. In Latin, the various species of Usnea are called Usnea barbata, Usnea longissima, Usnea berta, Usnea florida, and Usnea serotina. Because of its appearance, the common name of Usnea is old man's beard. The Dakota called Usnea chan wizivwe. This had been variously translated as on the north side of the tree or spirit of the north wind. Usnea is a major herb for treatment of mucous membrane systems, such as lungs, intestines, throat, sinuses, urinary, and reproductive tract. Usnea species grows throughout the northern United States. They can be recognized as a gray-green moss growing on fruit trees, fir, oak, and pine. All the species contain both antibiotic and antifungal compounds. They are usually tufted or hairy in appearance. 
On some trees in wetter areas, it may hang in long, massive strands. In Colorado, it generally glow, grows in small tusks at the base of pines and firs, and it can be toughed up to the size of a kiwi fruit and may cover an entire stumps or dying trees. The herb is composed of two plants in symbiosis. The outer portion, the cortex, contains the antibiotic compounds and it's gray-green in color. The inner portion, the thallus, is visible as a thin white thread inside the cortex if you pull a piece of usnea apart. The thallus contains immune-stimulating substances. The thallus is elastic when wet, somewhat like a rubber band, and stiff when dry. Usnea is round, not flat, and it covers by minute projections, papillate. It looks kind of hairy or fuzzy. Powdered or whole, it can be applied to skin infections with excellent results. Tinctured in alcohol, eaten whole or as a tea, it can be taken for internal problems from tuberculosis to acute bacterial infections. As a douche, it can be used to treat trichomonas and yeast infections. Herbalists generally use eusnea clinically for fungus infections, acute bacterial infections, lupus, trichomonas, mastices, vasiros, and tropical ulcers, second and third degree burns, plastic surgery, athlete's foot, ringworm, urinary tract infections, colds, flu, bronchitis, pneumonia, tuberculosis, sinus infections, staph infection, dysentery, and streptococcus. Usnea species are very effective in the treatment of tuberculosis. In fact, usnic acid, one active component, component in usnea, completely inhibited the growth of tuberculosis in dilutions of 1 to 20,000 and weakened their growth at 1 to 200,000. Other sources put the effectiveness of usnic acid at one part per million, bringing it to the effective range of streptomycin. From this perspective, effective doses of usnea tincture would range from 2 to 7 drops 3 times a day. Effective treatment would need to last 6 months. Usnea has a broad use across many cultures. The world over from general, a wound, a wound healer. The Canary Islands to, to Italy, the anti, to antiseptic in Argentina the antibacterial agent in Saudi Arabia to anti-tumor agent in Chile. Usnea has also been used culturally in delayed menstruation in both Korea and Arabic countries. It is used during pregnancy is contraindicated. Usnea is poorly water soluble so that use as a whole herb or as an alcohol tincture is preferred. However, it has traditionally been used as a tea or an infusion. Some of the beneficial components are available in a water medium. Given Usnea's prevalence in North America, it is surprising that there is little information about it on its use by North American tribes. All other world cultures seem to know of it and use it for a variety of complaints, physical and spiritual. It was used for abscesses by the Kioa and as a dye by many other tribes. Usnea represents the north, the place of gray hairs. It maintains the lung system of the planet. When Usnea came to me, personified as a young man, and spoke to me of its uses, it told me that there was healing qualities that were specific for the lung system of the planet, the trees. Its use for the people was secondary to this primary function. This was the first time I realized that plants provided medicinal actions with the ecosystem. That they evolved and developed to help the earth ecosystem, Gaia, maintain a healthy balance within itself. I realized at that time that it was only because we are a part of of the ecosystem that the plants also work for us as healing agents. 
Usnea fight off infection in the trees and thus serves as a crucial function in maintaining rainfall patterns. A potent aspect of Usnea's power is that of the power of the tree. There is an ancient compact between Usnea and the trees, and coming into contact with the deeper spiritual aspects of Usnea, one makes contact with ancient powers that existed a long time before humans. As my relationship with Usnea deepened and I traveled more into the spiritual territory that Usnea inhabits, I found that unlike the Pasque flower, Osha, and Angelica, Usnea's territory wasn't as easy to understand. It is less familiar to my human sensibilities. These landmarks, these landmarks make less sense, and it is more disorienting. I found that to make deep relationship with Usnea, I had to first make relationship with the deeper spiritual aspects of the tree and ask permission to have relationship with Usnea. Grandfather Usnea, you stride from the north with long legs and I call on you in behalf of all human beings requesting your teachings. Remind us of the interconnectedness of all things. Speak to us of the ancient pact between yourself and the trees and bring us your healing powers. Angelica, an herb of the East. The botanical names for Angelica species are Angelica Archangelica, a Pinati, Angelica Grei, Angelica Hendersoni. But Angelica's common names reveal the sacred uses to which it has been put. High Angel or High Angelica, Archangel, Master Wart. Wart meaning root or herb from the Old English wort, i.e. root or herb of the master. The names refer primarily to its angelic qualities. The Creek Indians called it Notosa. Angelica is used by herbalists as a reproductive normalizer to stimulate delayed menstruation for cramps, reproductive or intestinal, to normalize digestion and relieve flatulence. As an expectorant during coughs and colds, as a diaphoretic and a diuretic, and diuretic, to cure urinary tract infections, it is a urinary antiseptic. It has some use in relieving joint inflammations. It will stimulate the body to fight off viral infections. Though not so well as a relative, OSHA, as its relative, OSHA, the part used is primarily the root, though the seeds work very well for stomach nausea. The stems and leaves have a weaker action. In Europe, they are used candied as a dessert and to some extent in the liquor industry as a flavoring. Angelica's root can be eaten in its raw, whole form, simply carrying a portion of the root and nibbling at it from time to time. Generally, the root is used as a tincture, 30 to 60 drops, up to four times a day. The seeds can also be tinctured, 10 to 30 drops, up to four times a day, or several seeds can be taken in the raw form and chewed. Because Angelica and Osha are in the same family as hemlocks, they bear a slight similarity to some of them. Osha can sometimes be confused with poison hemlock, Angelica with water hemlock. The root and, to a lesser degree, the seeds and leaves have a unique and readily identifiable smell, slightly celery-like, but uniquely that of Angelica. After picking, if you run your fingers along the, its cut root, its interior has a slippery, soap-like feel. The leaves are large and divided into smaller ones and lengthened oval in shape, perhaps three to four inches long. Since Angelica can be fused, confused with water hemlock, which is quite poisonous, certain identification is an absolute must. The plant often grows up to six feet tall with an impressive stalk 
topped with characteristic umbel of flowers and seeds. Over 18 American Indian tribes used angelica species for medicine in a similar manner to that of Western medicinal use. I have found it to be of particular use in normalizing menstruation, relieving cramping and nausea. Its use during pregnancy is contradicted. The Creek Indians chewed the root and swallowed the juice or smoked it with a dry tobacco for disorders of the stomach. Coming upon Angelica, I am always struck by the feeling of femaleness and strong purity of spirit that the plant emanates. It is a shy plant, rarely in great abundance. It is a plant of water, always growing near a water source. In sitting in meditation with the spirit of Angelica, it is clear that the plant sits in balance between heaven and earth. The powerful hollow stem rises up and carries the great spirit energy between the realms. Many shamans have carried the stem of Angelica as a staff to help them maintain balance while traveling in the spirit worlds. The spirit of Angelica is strong and may offer help to women who have an empty place within them, like the Angelica stem. Go and sit with the plant, and after making a relationship with it, ask with the part of you that is empty, that it come into place and reside there as an ally. Each plant carries a special spirit energy that can help when used as a spirit medicine. Angelica is a plant of the East, and it embodies those qualities. It carries within it vision, wisdom, and enlightenment, and mature balance. Its main strength and power is that of the mature spiritual and emotional balance and strength in the face of conflicting demands from the environment, whether spiritual, emotional, or physical. I use this plant often in helping women who feel out of balance with themselves suffer from hysterical asthma or whose reproductive organs are out of balance who tend to lose themselves and others suffer from anorexia nervosa and for those who need a model of spiritual balance and strength and using the plant as a spirit medicine it is not enough to just ingest it as a medicine one must sit in relation with the plant and have it agree to help. One must develop a family relationship with the plant until it becomes as a sister. Well, there we have it. An incredible list of four plants that have immense sacred healing powers. Our ancestors all over the world have knowledge of these plant medicines and the earth provides it for us and in turn we take care and protect the earth and make sure these plants continue to grow. By learning about them, by observing them, by speaking with them and sitting with them and slowing it down. And I want to let everybody know that in the beginning, I wasn't sure if Dan was going to make it onto this chat, but he does make it. And so he makes it in about halfway through, which is fantastic. So need not worry. It is not just a solo show. We get extra juicy when Dan pops in. Here we go. <laughs> Without further ado, get ready for today's interview with Chance Garten on the Solfeggio Scale. Cheers. Rising from the ashes. Hey. Everybody, welcome to Rising, Rising from the Ashes. It is the Homie Romy here yet again on a solo journey 
down the wondrous, mysterious path of esoteric and beautiful conversations without Dan. He's left me high and dry yet again, but I think I will weep about it later. Anyways, he might pop in. Um, today we are speaking with a wonderful man, a, uh, a dowser of sorts. Um, I've heard him talk about the, uh, the different types of dowsing and, um, and the tunings, tuning fork processes. And it's very, very interesting, especially after we just talked to Marty Kane and dropped an episode about dowsing and geomancy. So it's going to be cool to kind of, kind of have these topics intertwine, um, chance amongst, uh, being a beautiful healer, uh, is a podcaster, researcher, and, um, a decoder of the mysteries and I have done other shows with him you guys know him and to know him is to love him Chance Garden is here hello sir hey man thank you for the beautiful introduction and uh do miss Dan I do you know the whole reason we got a show booked was because me and Dan had a lovely phone call a while back and we're like we need to put something on the calendar so I do hope he pops in, but it's okay if he doesn't. Maybe he'll check this out later, and he's with us in spirit. You know, Dan's the man. So he is the man. Not to lament, not to begin this festive conversation with lamentations, (laughs) but uh, (laughs) Romy, and you're enough. You're enough fun. You know, just you. So I've been looking forward to it all day, dude. Nice. And we're gonna do some exploration. Um, I guess I'll tell people. My channel is called Innerverse. Yes. Right? Yes. Po- Innerverse Podcast. Uh, I've been today cooking up a lot of merch. I've been an Ooh. artist on the side for, I don't know, 10 years. So I've got a lot of freaking art that I never really, you know, I like for a while I was making art with the intent of like, I'm going to be, a, I don't know what you call it, like professional artist that gets paid <laughs> to do it. Yeah. So, and then, you know, podcasting became more the thing, but I had the, I have this big stockpile of art and I'm finally getting around to turning it into cool, proper merch. And I'm having a lot of fun with that. Like the tweaking of the, you know, the design to make it fit the sleeves and then the front and back of the shirt and all the little aspects of the different things you can do with merch. So can you describe one of your new shirts to it? What is a, can you give us a a description of what they might look like? Cause this sounds fun. I like this. I like this. Yeah, you know, maybe I should just, can I just screen share it? Screen share what I'm it. working on. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you guys are on the Patreon, yeah. that's where the video yeah. version of this episode is going to be. If you guys are listening, we'll try to give you some some descriptions, uh, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's what Exactly, you get, yeah. So the, uh, the, the, store is, the store is innerversemerch.com, but it's like a Teespring, you know. It's one of those, but... Mm-hmm. I've only managed to get a few things up there, but since we're talking about it and you're graciously letting me uh, self-promote, I'm going to screen share it. So. Yeah, man. I love it. I love here's, it. Here's oh, shit. T-shirt. That is Can dope. Wow. Yeah, as I'm calling it the Everything is Buddha tea. <laughs> so sure to be helpful when you want to start conversations about how every savior de- deity is actually Buddha. And you got Buddha on the front and then, you know, your nice fallen angel on the back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hermetic so, shirt. So yeah, repurposing some of my artwork to uh, be clothing is pretty fun. I, I put one into a puzzle today. What? So this is a, 500 a puzzle? Piece puzzle. <laughs> what? I know you can do a lot on Teespring. So thank you, thank you YouTube for finally monetizing me after six years, so that I can link a Teespring to my YouTube channel. And <laughs> you know maybe they aren't so bad after all. Just kidding, they're terrible. But <laughs> yoga mat, you know you might want what? this. Me. Yoga mat. Look at this. Whoa. Whoa. Inspired by the uh, Aqua Cure. This design was inspired by the Aqua Cure machine, George Wiseman's device. So, how was how it inspired by the Aqua of, Cure? I'm very curious. Um, It's the. Because <laughs> it's derived from the art I made to be the background motion graphics for the episode I did with George Wiseman. So, <laughs> oh, nice, nice. You know, that, and it's got the Aqua vibes, count? the color, and the. Yes, I love it. Exactly. I love it. Well, that's a great kickoff, I think. Oh, dude, Look thank at... you for letting me promo some merch, dude. Of course, man. Hey, you know, uh, I hope that people would go out and support you and get a puzzle. Uh, do that, have that puzzle in their bookshelf where they have puzzles and pop it out of the party, man. Like, that's that's what it's all about. You know, like, doing this type of content creation, 
um we give a lot of very great free stuff away because we that's that's what it's about it's about community and those people pay uh it forward um when they know that the hard work is put in so any who's it is all here for you this is your day the day to shine happy birthday i love you so much uh so i wanted to uh to you know, kind of you know, get... i want to say thanks to everyone just for listening though you know yes. Lis- listening is a great gift you guys we do these conversations because we want to have them and but it makes it feel even better to know that you guys like it too that it's enlightening and entertaining mm-hmm. and maybe a little better than just noise in your ear hole to help you pass the time might even change your life sometimes <laughs> i like to think that personally <laughs> noise with benefit <laughs> yeah hopefully not like just noise for the sake of noise but <laughs> we're gonna talk about today so as romy mentioned i do uh, I'm a human tuner, right? We've had a, a while back, we had a rising from the ashes about that. I think mm-hmm. I was way earlier in the journey at that point. Yeah. My level of experiences is far, far beyond. Like I was a lot more hypothetical, conceptual, researching it a lot, starting to practice. But now I've done, I don't know, I've tuned like probably a couple hundred people if I had to guess. Definitely a shitload of people. I don't know. Not exactly keeping track. It's a lot of humans, man. It's really fascinating. It is. And what I like about it is that, well, I like a lot about it, I'll say. (laughs) And, you know, if we want to recap some of the the ropes of, like, what that is, as we, at some point in this conversation, I'm cool with that. But, um, you know, what I've learned, maybe the deepest lesson overall, one of, (laughs) is that what makes it so simple as a practitioner is that we are all way more similar than we are different. Even though we have completely unique lives, completely unique experiences, nobody's story is exactly the same. I liken it to a painting, right? Look at any of the masterpiece paintings of history and they're all completely different. Like no AI could do that. No one could replicate exactly brushstroke for brushstroke somebody else's work, even if it wasn't a masterpiece yet. Every one of those paintings was made with the same palette of colors, Mm. right? Mm. (laughs) So human beings are the same way, right? We got like this chakra system, which is very tangible, at least whenever you're using it as your conceptual framework to talk to the body like a language. Mm -hmm. It's very tangible. And those colors that are those chakras uh, have a lot to do with tone. Cymatics and colors are probably the same thing in a way (laughs) you know and cymatics if that's a a new word for people probably not around here but that's one of the things we're going to be getting into today cymatics being the vibratory patterns created by sound waves Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah you i feel like you got some responses let it rip always man always well i want to start off with just I, i brought up in the introduction like dowsing um and i know that you might or i know that you use it within your tuning um practice but like i don't know if you consider yourself like a a medical dowser or whatever that term or verbology is but is that something that you implement into your uh sessions or how you find where to yeah buddy i have these yeah it's it saves so much time because whenever we're talking energy field the toroidal field that is our body is embedded within, right? The it's a big field, man. It's like six feet off the body in all directions, <laughs> front, back, left, right. So, and in the process of biofield tuning, which you know, I, mean, I use that phrase. It belongs sort of to the um, to Eileen McCusick, a friend of mine who pioneered the entire thing. Oh wow! I really should never bring it up without her. She's the shit. Uh, so you can find her work at the Biofield Tuning Store or looking up her books. Electric Body, Electric Health is the newest one. Eileen Day McCusick, totally incredible time. And her theory, I guess we could call it a theory. I mean, once you put it into practice, it becomes very much more like a law than a theory. But I'm still totally open to the idea that it's an imaginary framework like any other language. Mm -hmm. Let's communicate, you know, a, uh, this is not my Dalai Lama tea mug here in nature would not just let alone be called mug, right? It's just, it is what it is, but (laughs) 
the biofield anatomy is the language that Eileen pioneered where we have the ability to communicate with our bodies through this conceptual framework of what type of energy is in what part of the field around the body. This is extraordinarily helpful, even if you're not a tuning practitioner, because like for me, if I ever get a boo-boo, <laughs> you know, I have now the, the knowledge of like, what does that part of my body represent in my emotional life mm -hmm. or my progress forward in life, so to speak. And mm -hmm. that helps the healing process really fast. In fact, in fact, it is so like the knowledge is becoming so tangible and real for me that the other day I had, uh, I got a, <laughs> got a voice bubble from a friend who I love very much and they were having a band. And I feel like they kind of took it out on me and like, you know, I'm, and I'm personally very sensitive to uh, people trying to make me feel bad. Like I have had a history of bad relationships before I got myself yeah. in order where the whole dynamic was like being made to feel bad. It's like a strange like playing archetype, on my, dude. <laughs> playing know? on the fact that I care and I want to be good. Mm -hmm. It's well, it's more, it's pretty common. So I got this voice bubble to be made to feel bad. And, you know, I'm not saying I wasn't at fault for the, for sort of triggering the, her feeling, mm -hmm. his friend, but mm -hmm. it felt it in my shoulder. Oh, <laughs> like wow. I, felt, I immediately like, it immediately aggravated a, a shoulder injury that I got from another sort of friction issue with a friend a few weeks before that had been healing. Oh, shit. Um, but, you know, because I immediately realized that, I realized that this re-injury of the shoulder thing uh, was connected to this, the energy of this message I just received. What it, well, and my lovely lady helped me step through this and help yeah. me see myself clearly. Thank God for healthy too. partnerships, but, man. Um, oh, so helpful, right? So she helped me walk through it, you know, and uh, talked to me, talked me through it, playing sort of the mediator between the sides and Eventually, I finally, after a little while, came to the realization of like, okay, here is why universe is presenting this situation. This is the lesson I need to learn about myself, the way I package how I speak, the motivation I have for what I say, and reconciling myself to the truth that like, okay, even though what I authentically want in my soul is to be good and do the right thing, you know, I recognize, oh shit, I was kind of like, doing some, what you would call like loosing or energy harvesting with the way I delivered a certain message that allowed me to be like holier than thou. Um, I did, I'm the good one and you're not type of feeling, which gave me a, a hit of energy at the time, but at the expense of somebody and maybe more than one person, but definitely a friend of mine's feelings who I'm not saying this friend was completely in the right with their side of it either. You know, with, uh, with <laughs> disputes, it's like nobody's Nobody's fully right. Nobody's fully wrong, usually. But anyway, the point is, I, I felt the shoulder injury come back in. I worked through the problem that I was having with the friend that related to the shoulder pain uh, on my side. <laughs> Figured out where I needed to learn a lesson about my behavior. And it got better. The issue got better. Like, it was within a wow. span of 30 minutes. Like, <laughs> oh, it hurts again. Working through it, figuring it out on the completely on the mental plane, oh, it, the tension went away. So everything that we experience in our body is like a message from our body, try, our higher self, our, our soul, trying to help us see ourselves more clearly and learn the lesson we need to learn in that moment. And the longer we reject the, uh, the message, the further we can go into disease, pain, you know, tension, injury, et cetera. So the biofield anatomy Learning that, which you can do if you pick up her books or, you know, check out some of my work on the subject or there's a lot of ways you mm -hmm. can learn this. And there's mm -hmm. probably other systems that are similar. And if you can learn this, then, and you're really, if you're willing to be radically honest with yourself, uh, it's a game changer. <laughs> you know, you can yeah. self heal so many, yeah. so many things. You can help other people see themselves more clearly. Like, you know, where, where are you at with, uh, where are you at with X, Y, or Z based on mm -hmm. where they're, they're hurt? And you can help them through that on really needs to be worked out, which is on their psyche being is psychosomatic yeah. in terms of the body. So yeah, I spit a lot at you though. 
right there. I love I love it, man. Well, that's it's true because I mean it's it's relevant for me actually, like currently, um, and it's always a helpful reminder for anybody that you know, like there's there's a lot of things that our body deals with, and it's not always just physical, and and a lot of times other. Uh, uh, more often than not, it might actually be more energetic than and emotional than it is physical. And so just reminding ourselves about this is incredibly important, brother. So I love it. Um, but yeah, more I'm saying back it always the, is. Oh, it always is. <laughs> it always is. It always is. Yeah. I have to always, you know, uh, the way I word things always leaves a little bit of wiggle room for uh, for all the for all the people on the fringe ends of whatever the fuck is being said at the moment. But um, I was very curious about what and how does this actual like dowsing and how do you figure out when and where? Oh like, yeah, dowsing. So curious to to me. I love that. Like, is there a specific tool that you use? Yeah, yeah. I'm a fan of the L rods, which are like L shaped copper mm -hmm. rods with mm -hmm. either a copper handle that can swivel or beads, like wooden beads. You would want something that could still conduct your body's electricity. I almost grabbed them. I have my fortune stuff back here, but I don't have the L rods on me. How I use them, I guess you could call it like medical dowsing. But I say, as I was saying, the biofield around the body is pretty large. So if I was going to be sweeping through somebody's field, left, right, front, back, and up, down, you know, that could be like a three hour process. And so wow. what I do at the beginning of work with the client is I basically starting at their feet then ankles, then knees, then root chakra through crown. So like 10 areas. I do this 10 times, basically. No, I do it 20 times, I guess. It takes about five minutes. And I'll say like, I'll tell, I'll tell the rods like, okay, am I tuned into whatever their name is? And then the rods will go whoop, open. And then while they're open, I'll say, show me no. And then they'll oh and close again oh, so <laughs> in my cool. hands so they swivel left and right on the beads and mm -hmm. they open and close and so then i you know i've i've modified this process over time and where i'm at now this is the most efficient way to do it that i have found and like so it was different I, there's been various iterations of this but now what i do is say i'm looking at the root chakra i'll go i'll go left side of the root chakra and the right dowsing rod will be the front of the body and the left dowsing rod will be the back of the body. So you identify and them I'll a place up. beforehand, before establishing and going in, you say, you are this and you are this. And just to like re reify that in a moment. Oh, cool. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So, so the two rods are actually operating independently for me. So as I approach the table where their body is, which is actually just a bunch of crystals and candles usually, <laughs> Although I do occasionally do in-person tunings as I approach the table where their body is, then I, um, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the left side of their root chakra. I'm looking at the red candle and mm -hmm. you know, one rod, the right rod might open, the left rod might stay closed as I get to the table. And then that tells me that the back side of the root chakra on the left. So the back left quadrant, like, you know, their, their left glute, for example, would be like a correlate area or left, the back of the left hip correlate area in the body. Tell me, okay, there's some stuck energy that needs to be addressed in that quadrant of the field for that chakra area. I repeat that process left, right, front, back um, for all of the energy centers of the body. It actually doesn't take that long, three to five minutes. And I, I take note of where there's, you know, where the dowsing rods tell me to do it. And that gives me my roadmap for potential areas to work on in the session. Still not necessarily a guarantee that I can get to all the areas that their body said that it wanted help on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in one hour, depending on how many places are indicated. And then from there, it's like intuitive on mm -hmm. which areas I prioritize kind of. Um, but, you know, like if they're, if their sacral chakra is telling me front, back, left, right, all all areas help <laughs> and I help. definitely make sure and hit that area. <laughs> Whereas help. like, you know, if there's just one corner of, of one of the regions for a chakra, that might be one that I save for the end. If I don't think I can get to them all. And, you know, to can again about the dowsing. I love the ask about this. I love dowsing. Uh, there are other the ways to do it. Stuff, you don't need, honestly. it is. And uh, you probably like this. 
I, I developed this technique at Music and Sky Festival in your neck of the woods, kind of California. We were in SoCal. And I didn't have my L rods with me for this event. And I was doing these like tuning sessions for people where my plan was to just find their most bottlenecked energy center and just tune that one spot. Mm. That way I could do like a five ish minute tuning for somebody that could really enhance their flow state and their feeling of perpetual synchronicity without needing to like do a full tuning that could in invoke detox action in the body or make them feel exhausted <laughs> or mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. you know, we're not trying to do the full gamut cause that's a bit intense for being a out festival. at an event. That's a camping yeah. festival. Yeah. You want yeah, people some, to be able to, to just like pop walk away from a session and not lay there for the next two hours in complete enthrallment. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just to pop the bottleneck wherever it's at in their energy field, wherever the most choke pointed spot is. So what I did is, uh, I'll just like hit this big fork right here and scan it up and down their body and where the bottleneck spot energetically is, I'll get the memo. So for me, how that works is wherever I hit. <laughs> so I've, I think maybe using dowsing rods has been part of this. I think Qigong is a bigger part of this, but I think I've tuned my body to be the dowsing instrument itself without mm -hmm. the need for tools. Mm hmm because what I'm about to describe, I can do with my hands too, even if I didn't have, if I had no tools on me. And I have yet to try to do like a full tuning session without any implements, but I'm pretty sure I could. <laughs> and so well, let me ask you about, I, let me ask you about that. Brother, well, let me because, finish this real oh, quick, yeah, buddy. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So I just want to lay this little part on you. Whenever I am like querying, looking for some, something like I'm looking for stuck energy in this area of the field where the dowsing rods told me it was, or I'm scanning up and down their body, looking for where the bottleneck spot is in their energy field. When I hit the spot, my ears pop every oh, time. Shit. Oh yeah. So my body has become like a dowsing tool in and of itself, because when I find what I have asked to find what I'm looking for, my ears pop consistent hundred percent of the time. If I'm like, oh, let me double check, and I put my hand in that exact spot or I put the fork in that spot again, they pop again. It's wow. every time. Consistently so, like that. That's, that's, I'm not sure exactly how wild. I got that. It's kind of like a, a superpower. I think Qigong was a big part of it, though. They gave yeah. me that because, uh, yeah, it feels like electricity. It's like it's not like your ears popping whenever you're on a plane. Mm -hmm. And where you like you lose hearing, it feel I can feel sort of like a pressure differential in the eardrums for sure, but it doesn't cause a discomfort like going up and down mountains or an airplane. Uh, but it does pop and is really helpful. Wow! So that that is really fascinating because. So we, we just dropped this episode with this wonderful woman named Marty Kane, and she's a dowser that lives in North Carolina now. She's eighty two years old. She's been dowsing since she was five years old from her grandfather who taught her, who came over here from Lithuania, wow. who was a water, they called him the water Ooh, witch. Gotta... Yeah, she, family full of Lithuanian or Eastern European lineage that goes way back. And so, um, you know, just, just talking with her and like talking with, I've talked to a couple like geomantic dowsers so far and um, I'm kind of coming to this understanding that like, the rod is incredibly important, but after a certain point, you are the rod or like the human. It is about us. It is about the energy within us. These tools are there to signify and give you like that extra thumbs up. Like you got it. You're good. You know, you know the deal. But I mean, I feel like that is such an ancient I could not agree. tool, man, or an ancient. It's not even a tool. Like, what do we call it? Like, why does that? Have, it's dowsing is it's so esoteric in, in its nature man like it's it blows my mind like we could do this entire episode probably on the concept of dowsing uh to be honest but <laughs> but we're not we probably could but like i think that you know more about it than me man if you want to bring a dowsing conversation to my channel sometime because i think you've been researching it hella hard like maybe i've been in the paint doing it but you've been researching all the history of it in the different ways and I, I find that all very fascinating but what you said is key we are it's about our energy it's about us 
and the tools are really helpful, whether the tool is a language like the biofield anatomy, which helps us communicate with our, the intelligence of our body, or it's the rods, which helps us communicate with the intelligence of our body. Because <laughs> I mean, the way I see it is the, the life force energy that animates our vessel is not separate from the all of the pleuromic, pranic, life force energy of the creative intelligence of supreme beingness itself, <laughs> baby. You know, like That's it's the right. same energy. You can't separate <laughs> that. You can't like chop a part of that up and put it in one vessel and then put some of it in another vessel. It's the soup that everything swims in. So your life force energy is the creative intelligence and consciousness of all reality, self-existing, self-begotten, never ending, you know, can never be destroyed or created because it is what creates and you can communicate with that intelligence and the tools will help you do that because they signal a framework of understanding that allows that thing to talk back to you. But eventually, you know, you can develop ways to, once you realize what it is you're talking to, it will give you hints of like, here's another way you could do it. That's simpler, <laughs> you know, and it'll keep simplifying it often, at least in my experience, like, with Eileen McCusick, who I referenced earlier, her work started out using tuning forks and she still tunes people and teaches that. But, you know, where she's going right now is teaching. She's been researching and now is te starting to teach the sonic anatomy, uh, the alchemy of our vocalizations, you know. Oh, wow. So, like, yeah, she's like figuring out the sound that you can make with your voice that correlates to every part of your body. Oh, okay. Different sounds like root, mind. like root primal, you know, sort of monosyllabic. Uh, an example would be the, uh, the, the feet, the feet have a few sounds, the feet are down to like knees down to the feet have a few sounds, but one of the, the main sounds for your feet is wah, wah. <laughs> Wah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or for your heart, one of what I think is for the back of your heart. I still I'm like awaiting the my ability to take the class and learn all these vocalizations because it's super next level. I did it in a workshop with her at Music and Sky and got to experience it from you know beginning to end and make all the sounds. And dude, it was legit. But the back of the heart chakra is a really fun one because it's rawr. Oh, <laughs> oh rawr. Rawr. And I know there's something to it because the few that I have, other than my own experience, the few that I remember uh, uh, from that workshop, I have occasionally put into practice during tuning sessions with clients. And like one example, we we're working on some pretty heavy duty heart chakra stuff for somebody she was a nurse for her whole life like really an er nurse like really took on a lot of negative energy from her environment from other people due to her extremely open empathic nature and the toxicity of such a hospital you know workplace <laughs> and so there was a ton of i'm not saying like she was fucked up or anything but there's a lot of stuck energy in that region to move and as i was like working there and I was like Man, I think I need extra help I need you to help me do this more than me just use the the tones and the forks and so I was like all right get your raw on <laughs> you know and I, wa I walked her through it I was like you need a raw while I hit these forks and move this energy that's kind of stuck and uh keep roaring till I tell you to stop and dude she couldn't even get through RARs because she was yawning all of a sudden. She oh, wasn't tired. Wow. She wasn't underslept. She had not explain yawned to at people all. What the, but explain as soon to people as we what the yawning working, is because that's, I know that's a huge psychic energy thing. Well, yeah. Uh, I couldn't like, you know, hash it out in some scientific terms or anything, but <laughs> whenever some stuck energy in the field is, is we're working it, sometimes yawning, sometimes spontaneous need to pee, you know, stump, sometimes spontaneous crying. There's a lot of ways it can happen, but like all I'm saying is she went from fully awake and alert and she wasn't tired and she wasn't tired during this either to like couldn't stop yawning in order to get a full roar out. And wow. so we kept going until she could roar all the way without yawning. And that's also when I was getting the signal from her biofield and the forks that we had like, 
integrated that off balance energy properly. So yeah, the sonic anatomy thing is so awesome because it's getting us back to the core tool, which is our voice. That is the real tool. Ah. All the other stuff is just like, you know, imitation of what the real thing is. Not that I will always like to use forks. Mm -hmm. I like having the external thing. It's fun to play with like the technology of it, but your voice is the real technology, man. Dude, I love it so much. This is a great, um, this is such a good segue and kind of warm up into the topics that we're talking about. And makes sense because they're hand in hand. We're going into solfeggio, folks. That's the reason why we set this episode up. Um, But everything that's being talked about is, is so, so important because these are modern tactics, you know, to bridge the gap between the ancient ways like this ancient understanding of the biofield even though it's not written biofield in alchemical text or whatever that's what we understand it as this was understood in ancient times the toroid field the chakra system it was all written and beautiful yeah it's like what chinese medicine is based on it's chakras are based on exactly vedic medicine vedic history vedic temple building um old architecture is built on this stuff and the temples themselves were hand in hand uh built to resonate solfeggio tones and so it's awesome and so i'm so glad we're doing this and i want to hand the mic back over to you brother how are we going to walk our way into understanding solfeggio this evening so like i said i don't i told you this off the air i don't have like a concrete presentation outlines but i have a lot of tabs open <laughs> perfect no. so i just want to i just want to explore the topic with uh, with everybody i'm not going to be making any major claims about it but mm-hmm. i will say i use selfagio tuning forks i have a set back here here nice. is the 174 so if anybody's interested in getting into doing you know playing with frequency in a sort of medical sense, energy healing sense, I recommend the 174 all day. This is the, I could do everything that I need to do in a client session with just this fork if I wanted to. And I like to use the other tones. And, you know, before we talk about like what Selfeggio is, I'll just, (laughs) I guess it's hard to know where to start. (laughs) Okay. So what Selfeggio is, is a set of nine, frequencies and we're going to explore what those nine frequencies are uh, going forward and what I think makes them special. Maybe I have some criticism about what the internet says about them. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. We love that. We need that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There, Cause there's some serious new age bullshit about Selfeggio and I don't know. It's just like so much. Uh, the more I do my own research into things versus just listening to the talking heads, the more I realize that most people on most subjects in the truth community are repeating each other's information without really like looking into the source. I myself have been guilty of this. Don't get me wrong. Like, you it's know, never, bro it's science, a human, it's a podcast human bro thing. science is like, it's a human thing. But the thing is that like, it, it it hurts it hurts us all makes it's all it's a bad look for all of us whenever we're repeating information that is unfounded and from yeah. the outside just looks like you know looks silly so selfeggio has that going on um i'll, I'll share my screen i'll be co- popping off I'll, different I'll, screen shares i'll say go, like but it, it's funny because anything uh, and i'll, I'll narrate what age. we're looking at too Anything in the new age woo woo, you know, for lack of a better term, new age woo woo is just kind of one of the go to phrases for that. Um, they're they're ripping off of incredibly ancient truths that are real and that are important that need to that need to be brought up in today's society. But like you said, a, a lot of it gets construed and uh, misconcepted when people are trying to just you know make their content, make their page. Though a lot of it is ringing in like an actual ancient truth, uh, you know, through the game of telephone or through people's, you know, different interpretations of it, what have you, but it is, it is incredibly important. And so having these different types of discernment, like your own, uh, it's, it's awesome. And like, I actually trust 
trust your judgment because of uh, just how I know you work and operate and that uh, that devil's advocacy that you do have and display, I think is uh, it's going to make your mark in this uh, world and industry, brother. Oh, and look who it is. Dan's here. Oh, my goodness. Dan has arrived just Dan in time. I'm is, just about to oh, start getting into yes. self -edgio. Yes. Really good timing, man. Great timing. It's so, it's, it's welcome, impeccable. brother. So what, what I, what I have screen shared here is the self -edgio, like the common new age correlations to the self -edgio tones. So I'll read through them here. You have uh, 174 is said to reduce pain. Yeah, I, maybe I won't read through all of them. 528, repair DNA. 963, awaken perfect state. 396, turn grief into joy, etc. So in my experience, all this list is n actually nonsense. And <laughs> I don't know where it came from, to be honest, but it is everywhere. If you look up the phrase self edgio you're almost guaranteed to find YouTube videos that list these qualities to these tones. And, you know, they're making claims that are impossible. What is so funny about it is they're claims that are impossible to prove or disprove. So I think a big part of where, if I had to guess, I think a big part of why this has been popularized in terms of these correlations to the tones is probably to do with like YouTube channels that want to get a lot of views mm -hmm. for videos that took them very little work. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, let's yeah. just put this tone on a video and say that it's going to repair your DNA and it's an eight hour loop and, mm -hmm. you know, people be watching it and repair their DNA. They want a quick fix without any actual, you know, the hardest, the, the hardest, the hardest part of making those to, videos, you know, if you want to facilitate change, you don't play a four, one, seven tone. You, you find what you need to change and what you're wrong about and, you know, do the work. So now here's the other caveat I want to make, and then I'll let you, I'll let you go around me. The other thing I want to say is my experience with coherent sound of any kind, whether it's a self edgio tone or not, is that it is a carrier of our intention. And so if, you know, I'm not saying that it, these qualities that are listed here are impossible to get out of self edgio tones, but I am saying that they're not automatically going to do the things listed here. And I'm sure about that. <laughs> and so I think I consider it to be quite like a, definitely like a, uh, unfortunate internet culture development that self edgio has been tied to this new age list of qualities that, you know, return to spiritual order for 852. <laughs> Can you please tell me like what you mean by that? Or <laughs> uh, solve 741, solve and clean. Does that mean if I play a 741 fork, I've got it right here. Is it going to, it's my house going to spontaneously become clean? I would love that. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, <laughs> it's silly. So, yeah. um, you know, and that's not criticism of the frequencies themselves. I think they're quite magical. And I think that it's been, you know, it took me playing with them and, and tooling around with the uh, relationships between the tones to come up with some ideas about what I think might be going, what might make them special. Uh, and we can get into that. But I just wanted to give that disclaimer that I'm not one of these people that's claiming that, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the 639 frequency is going to automatically mm -hmm. fix your relationships in your life because it won't it doesn't work that way there is no quick fix you have to the the what makes t tones in terms of how biofield tuning works what makes them useful is that they are an instrument in a language that allow you to talk to your body and find out what your body says you need to be aware of so that you can change it you have to become aware and then you have to change it this stuff isn't going to, you can't just like fix yourself without becoming aware of what was wrong. In my opinion, I think you need to know and that's the whole reason why the body gives, goes into states of disorder is so that you can find out, you can go through, through it to find out mm -hmm. what it is and then get to harmony on the other side. There's a lot more we could say about that. Stop there. A clue, a clue given from your very, very smart and in tune body to the mind to say like, Hey, this is happening. All I'm, all the answers are here. Deal with this. And you know, we'll, 
we'll get going and moving and grooving again. And if you if you listen, then uh, you know, or if you know somebody that listens, you know, you have a practitioner. Um, the body is speaking, and uh, it's it's part of the hardest part about existence is like knowing what to deal with or what what's going on. You know, like while we have all this information being thrown at us, um, you know, like all yeah, this- and even like some hardcore stuff that people are taught by the medical establishment is like you just are this way they're, you're fault mm-hmm. your body is faulty like uh one pattern that i've noticed I, I think i've seen it four or five times enough to feel confident that there might be a, a there there which is asthma uh, i've worked on several women who had asthma their whole life and then like severe and i'm not talking about a little bit of asthma i'm talking about severe asthma medication inhalers the whole nine and people that want to come off of that stuff or have come off of it but they feel like sometimes they struggle with it. And what I have found as a pattern with, I don't know about men, I haven't worked on a lot of men who had asthma, but for women who have had asthma, every one of them that I've worked on, I've wound up finding in their biofield that as a child or like a preteen, their dad either died or completely left the picture of their life. And it was all of them. And so, so, you know, working oh, wow. through the, working through the repressed, and deep set grief and trauma of that they may have already been trying to do, but connecting the dots of, I don't have asthma because there's something wrong with my body. My body has asthma as a reaction to this energetic gap in my Mm -hmm. uh, field constitution of the father being gone. And it's been trying to get me to notice that I still need, I need to connect those dots. You know, they need to connect those dots for their asthma to really get resolved. And it's like almost that simple <laughs> that they just needed to know that their asthma wasn't because there's something wrong with them. It was because they were traumatized by not having a dad or their dad dying. And, you know, there's always going to be sensitivity there. And so whenever they have asthma flare ups, if they do down the line, which could still happen, they can know that, okay, where, where am I grieving? You know, where am I feeling a lack of support from the masculine in my life, whether it's their husband or, you know, their new, their stepdad or or whatever, or even like a male figure that's like a boss. Am I feeling unsupported by them? You know, is is there's going to be a correlate where this sort of grief, lack of support circuit gets activated and then the asthma flows up. And then they, if they know that, if they know that, then they can work on it from the uh, sort of external level or the internal level and resolve the issue. The body is just doing these things to tell you where your emotional circuitry is getting out of whack. It's not that your body is broken or something is wrong with it. It's always a message. So that's the example I wanted to give. Oh, I I love it. Um, And I want, uh, I want to give Dan a chance to say his, his greetings here and all the things, but, but one thing I wanted to point out about, um, about the those solfeggio uh like healing videos on youtube um just from experience of like making music and stuff like the hardest part about making those videos is the time it takes to process the video and upload it to (laughs) youtube other than that like it is dragging stretching copy paste you know rhetoric so um anybody if you know no shame if you use those things but just know that um you know like it's yeah, all they make a lot you of feel good about, in some way i'm not saying yeah. don't use it i'm i'm just saying that they're spreading bad information as well i i agree opinion. i agree but your intention can be carried on a frequency so if you're like really you know if you're like super good at meditating your intention into reality and you like to use those type of videos to help you do it mm-hmm. i'm not saying don't i'm just saying i think that's why this me- this correlation is spread Mm -hmm. around and it is like it's like many things in the truth community it's like lazy research that gets repeated Mm. 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 not to burst anybody's bubble (laughs) (laughs) you know if you make those kind of videos i am not hating you know maybe you've got some really cool graphics with it too like it's all good but i don't think that that's really the end all be all of understanding self-edgio that's for sure yeah like there there's 
a commu- like at one point, and I think I we will go into this. I would love to maybe segue into this next, like more like history and uh, some of the reasons of these triads grouped together and then flipped, you know, and switched like how they have the the trinity of numbers there in the triangle and how they uh, the number switches as the octaves go up, which is super fascinating. Which means there's some sort of celestial alignment or um, a a predetermined archetype that's attached to those numbers that has this correlation that is so deep and and ancient because we're talking about the days of Pythagoras and Daddy Pythagoras and and before him and all the things. But like I said, Dan, what's happening, brother? Uh, how are you? I want to give you a proper greeting, man. What's up, man? Uh, cool. Let's go. <laughs> nice. I don't really have much to say. Uh, <clears throat> been working all day. Uh, I had a question though, Chance. Like, I, I know that you do this within the body, but is there is is there like a a biofield to like a town or a city where maybe you could see that there's uh, something uh, not connecting in that biofield, which is causing uh, like societal turmoil? That's a really awesome question, man. The thing with towns and cities is they're not all laid out the same, the way that every human body is loosely the same. Mm. And what you just asked as a question might really be a clue towards why there was a certain architectural standard to cathedrals yes. and temples. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, making some kind of parallel to the body in your architecture makes a ton of sense and having a system for that makes a ton of sense. Like music theory makes it, the more I learn about it, even though I can't read music yet, the more I learn about it, the more like at first I was sort of like, are they keeping us in the box? Are they trying to limit our musical expression? And now I'm like, no, they're giving us a language. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of freedom in that language to communicate through, but it allows all of us to talk, you know, through music. I think now I, I'm kind of uh, totally into music theory as a good thing. Mm-hmm. There's a reason, there's a method to the order that is probably for the good and probably far predates any systems of draconic control that may have implemented it themselves. So your question is awesome. On some level, energetically, there has to probably be a biofield to the bubble that humans create when they congregate. Like I know whenever I've gone to big music festival events where it's like super high energy and it's out in the middle of nowhere, right? Like on a mountain or some shit. And there'll be a point where you cross some threshold of approaching the event. You're almost there. You've been in basically in nowhere in nature, nobody around you cross this threshold of the bubble space of the event. And it's just like, (laughs) I'm here. I feel it. Yes, 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 yes. So, I mean, that's, there's something to that, you know, and what you're saying, um, maybe it'll, maybe eventually human beings (laughs) will get to the point where we can like diagnose and detect illnesses in the body energetic body of uh towns or Mm -hmm. maybe a household or something Mm -hmm. uh that's a very interesting thought Mm -hmm. i love that question yeah 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 i had another one brewing and i lost it (laughs) i i like uh i like thinking about the that too dan and uh, it's crazy because you know you totally feel where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there, you know? And I think us tuning in and tapping into that and just like being with ourselves and having introspective times to understand like what feels good and what feels, um, you know, like the dowsing when we're talking about our bodies are dowsing rods. So like, are you leaning forward into this? Like, is this feeling good? Or do you really just want to go back? And if you want to go back, maybe, you know, be like, okay, what, what are we stepping into? Um, and you know, yeah, draconian powers that be understanding these ancient uh, esoteric cycles and ciphers and things. Absolutely, no doubt. But as long as we talk about them here and now, we're having the same type of information. And I think the seven sacred sciences, music being one of them, and solfeggio is music theory. Like you're talking about music theory, whether it's good or bad. I, I went through the same shit because 
you know, I wanted to be a self-taught musician. I didn't want to take any music. I didn't want to take guitar classes. I didn't want to learn anybody else's songs. I was like, no, like this is too, it's too structured. It, there's got to be a more natural way to understand these things. But as, as I get further down it too, I'm like, okay, wait, music theory is a code. It is a cipher. It is a labyrinth. It is celestial too. And it has mathematical correspondence as well as astrological correspondence. And the deeper going into the esoteric research, I'm finding out that music vibration is everything as well as shape and physical structure and it all boils down to that. And so, like, let's segue into one, because I, I know you have some good etymology of the word so, and the tone selfeggio. But can we go into the the number correlations? Because as you go through the selfeggio scale, it's the same three numbers grouped in three different patterns. And then they shift up. And what what are those numbers? Like, why are they grouped together? Oh shit! Here we go. Sorry, music, man. I had music is a wheel. Music is a wheel itself, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it, like on guitar, it goes from E to E again. So you guys e can see my screen well, though, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. We are up and okay. Cool. So I'll I'll narrate this as we go too for people just listening at home. But I made this, I made this like <laughs> infographic on what I think is special about Solfeggio. So I, I started off, it was going to be small, and then I just kind of kept going. So we'll scroll through this. But I think maybe whenever that quote that is famously attributed to Tesla, that as far as I know, is not anywhere in his own writings or <laughs> recorded <laughs> statements. Classic. That if you understand 3, 6, and 9, you understand the secrets of the universe. Uh <laughs> I don't know if Tesla ever said that or if Tesla even existed as Secrets. described, but but uh, there is something very interesting about 369 with Solfeggio. And, you know, if people are familiar with my channel and my work, I do a lot to decode the uh, esoteric astrotheology and the Trinity is a really big part of the mm -hmm. universal system that all of our religions around the world derive from. So this 369 is like an expression of the Trinity in number, right? <laughs> and in terms of Selfeggio, okay? So if you went and, like, you Google the term Selfeggio and, you know, you land on Wikipedia, you'll get a page that talks about the hymn to St. John the Baptist from about a 1,000 years ago where supposedly it was the first time notated in music the idea of do re mi fa so la ti was ever put forth uh, i oh. don't really think that's the same thing <laughs> as these tones because i can't see i like you know i think that that's more of the i think that's i think those are different things technically that is solfege and this is solfeggio i don't know who decided to coin these numerical values solfeggio it's confusing, but that's what we're talking. We're talking about nine sets of numbers in each of these, you know, like really when you think about Solfeggio, to me, the magic of it is more in the relationship, numerical relationship than the actual sound <laughs> itself. I know that sounds bizarre, but in, in my experience, you can do anything with a coherent tone, like, uh, I, it's probably sounds distasteful to people, but I think I could tune somebody's biofield with a 440 fork, even though there's like a lot of 440 conspiracy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I've done, I even have a video queued up if we want to look at it. Like, you know, I've done my best to look without having the ability to run cymatics through plates and sand myself to see the difference between 432 and 440. And, you know, it depends on how you, how you derive the cymatic pattern and sometimes 440 looks dirty, but sometimes it looks like just different, but not like it's bad. So all that being said, you know, I guess to finish the loop on 440 and 432, I think that maybe the issue when it comes to the 440 is that if you were making a chromatic scale of C, uh, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, right, that your 
440 as A would give you other nodes that get into fractions or decimals. And I think that that could be maybe why overall it has a less good vibe to it. That's just a, that is just a personal theory conjecture. With 432, all the other notes up and down the scale are going to give you uh, whole numbers. And even that, you know, I don't know. I won't get lost in the weeds on that. This big fork I have right here is a 384. Maybe I should it. Yeah, <laughs> tap that puppy. <laughs> goes forever this is a big ass fork uh <laughs> it would ring forever if i let it i could do all i could do a whole session with just this it's really about having a coherent sound when i mm -hmm. say coherent sound i mean like something where if you were to look at it visually depicted the peak and trough were e even with each other mm -hmm. where the vibration was symmetrical and consistent you know even if it starts to peter out and get quieter the peaks and troughs above and below the middle line if you're looking at a visual representation would remain in a consistent pattern so when i that's what i mean coherent sound pretty much any coherent sound can carry an intention and, and that intention can be used for healing purposes or harming purposes i guess but definitely healing purposes i try not to really worry myself about the harming purposes they seem pretty evident in the lyrics of modern music without needing to get into like the actual frequencies you know but back to this phrase we have called solfeggio it's a term given to a special set of nine numbers and many believe the coherence of these frequencies has healing properties when played as audible tones the numbers are as follows 174 which is And then, I love uh, forks so much. You guys, should I just play each of them? Yes. Is that cool? Yes, please. Okay. And uh, so that's 174. Then we have 285. And can we, can we potentially, like, uh, after you play them, or can, is there, a, like, a... Um, symbolic correlation with each of these and uh, what what are they oh yeah um the answer to that is no <laughs> <laughs> i have some i have some ideas like we're going to get into that with this infographic what i oh sweet like so, so we'll we'll get into that some but okay so when i say like a coherent sound here's 396 So when I say that a coherent sound can carry an intention, uh, what I do with these personally, like when I first started, when, okay, when I first got a set of forks, I, I got a set called the Solar Harmonic set, which uses that 432 as A and gives you a fork for C all the way across to the next octave of C. And the C is supposed to be the root chakra. And as you go up, D, sacral chakra, E, solar plexus f heart chakra g throat chakra which is what my big fork is the 384 is a g for your throat um and on it goes up to the crown um so when i got those forks i found that they had a kind of a sedative sedative effect mm. on people that i worked on but i didn't use them long that my set of my set vanished on me in a really weird way we won't go into that but they just disappeared and um so I decided maybe that means I should got should have got the Selfeggio because I was really early in all this at that time. So I got the Selfeggio forks and they didn't vanish on me, <laughs> but I used them in a similar way. So this 396, I would use for the root chakra. But as I already said, I could use a 174 for the whole system if I wanted to. And I recommend people start with the 144 or 174 because the longer tines and the lower end frequency 
make it easier to detect changes in the tone if you are doing a t you know practicing the biofield tuning method where you want to try to find distortion in their energy field you would do that by playing this tone sweeping it through their energy field and trying to listen for where the fork changed in some way and then it's about your you know intuition helps you decide what that change means and why and it takes practice but you learn to communicate with the intelligence of the body that way so 396 I'm using for root and then for, uh, up the scale I'll name the chakra that I use for the fork as we go but again this is not like I do not consider this to be like some law of nature I don't mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. is a carrier of intent so for me because over and over again in sessions when I pull out this 417 that I'm holding right here I intend to tune the sacral chakra that means that like when I pull this out I don't have to be like okay I am now connecting to the sacral chakra and like really focus on that or get, you know, I, it's just seamless. I pull it out. I know what it's for. This is what I mean when I pull out this fork. And so it's like a shortcut, mm -hmm. but again, I could do it all with one fork if I wanted to, and any of these forks would work. So this is 417. You could correlate this with the sacral chakra if you want, <laughs> uh, but it's up to you. The 174, by the way, I use for like, when I am doing sessions, I use that for people's feet, ankles, and knees, everything under the root. And in fact, I don't even use the 285 in sessions. It's uh, something about it. Not that it's a bad tone. It sounds great, but it's, a, it's just harder of all of them. To me, that's the one that's hardest to like detect changes mm, and like mm -hmm, audibly mm -hmm. hear. So I don't use that one as much. But the 417, this is... You could say sacral chakra if you want to correlate it that way. And five, two, eight. So we have had one, seven, four, two, eight, five, three, nine, six, four, one, seven, five, two, eight. Now we're going to get into some of the combinations as well but i'm gonna stop there <laughs> for time's sake unless you think i should play all the should i play the other four yes okay you guys are into it all right all right, all right. sometimes <laughs> I, I get in a rush <laughs> there's no need to rush guys quit rushing me <laughs> 639 this could be uh you could correlate this to the heart chakra if you wish 639 Seven four one, throat chakra, if you like. Yeah, and uh, now we have eight five two, third eye. And last but last, last but not least, nine, six, three. Crown chakra. So some of those videos that I mentioned, you'll find uh, people claiming numbers like 1111 hertz being a self edgio and things further beyond the, they'll be like a 9,999 hertz frequency activate God mode. You know, like, none of those are self edgio in my opinion. And we'll get into, you know, that'll become evident as I talk about why I think these specific numbers are relevant. Uh, and I'd also like to maybe play a couple of them 
like together more than yes. one at the same time because that's oh, where yeah. a lot there's like some magic in that yeah. but yeah uh i'll you guys have anything to throw in or ask before i move forward in this in this whole thing about what makes no, number self edgy but but i did kind of feel like i could feel them in those areas not exactly the spot but at least uh the vibration when you did the 741 i felt it in my jaws mm. and then the 852 i felt in my like behind my eyes and the 963 i felt in the back of my head that is cool man i get that a lot when i'm doing sessions for people you know we're just on a call we're not on video or anything and they'll be like uh i'm feeling tingling in my chest <laughs> i'll have just started like working on the solar plexus or the heart mm -hmm. so um i cannot tell it's because those tones really do activate those parts of the body or because i was transmitting the intention mm -hmm. that we're connecting to that part you can't i you know it's chicken or an egg i don't think you can separate you don't think you can yeah. know but maybe there is a way to know someday. I'm just not making a claim about well, something you might, I know. You might need both. Just like these numbers need all three things. There's there there's probably multiple components that go into like the initial goal. Like I think a lot of the stripped uh stripped power away from us is that third component to a lot of things. You know, um, like we have one piece of really great information. You are the body that's like there with that knowledge of the information of the other thing. But then there's that one other, you know, so I think it's all necessary in that. Like, I mean, yeah, like I, I, I don't know if we should get into it on the air. I think I talked about it on our telegram and stuff. But when I, I, bought, I got a gifted a set of forks, man, and I got really into them in my room and they vanished from me as well. Like they got they got destroyed through just nature they ran over right they got ran over on yeah on the highway yeah. and uh <laughs> like i thought i had i had opened a portal with them because i was getting so into like meditating with them in my room and i literally asked for a portal to be open and then um my neighbor's house caught on fire like that following that same exact night like about two hours later bro careful bro well that, that's what i'm saying and and like those opening portals shit gets burned down it's it's so I think a lot of it is is like, you know, we talked about the negative stuff before, you know, it's like, I think I don't know if it's necessarily the numbers that are like a negative frequency, like the 440, 444. I think that's a bunch of like, relative mumbo jumbo. But I do think like you were saying, just a clear tone that goes through once that channel is open, once that clear tone is, there, I think the intention is like a huge other part of the component, um, whether it being like, you know, a shadow or a dark, you know, because pentacles can be summoned to bring angels or they can be summoned to bring demons, right? So, like, yeah, so the intention is a huge part in this, man. It's a huge part in it. Like, I think part of the intention of not maybe in the people who are spreading the research or doing the research, I am not trashing anybody about over that, you know, but. It's like, why do they tell everybody that the uh, cow poke on one hand, they're like, everyone get the cow poke. It's perfectly safe. And then on the other hand, they're like, you know, publishing information on the official sources about like deaths and shit. Uh, I think that that's part of the wizardry is to tell you that the thing is hurting you, you know, like tell everybody that the 440 music is making you ill or crazy. And uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, I think the conspiracy community may be unwittingly and unintentionally spreading poison in, in the information that they spread, mm, mm -hmm. which is really tricky. I'm not faulting anybody for that. I'm not calling anybody out specifically. We, we, would, we would have all been guilty of it at some point if that's true. <laughs> and, Inevitably so. So that's a, it's a, and I don't think, by the way, I'm not faulting you for your neighbor's house burning down. I don't think you did that. Uh, oh, wild, yeah. Wild coincidence. Yeah, yeah, definitely a wild <laughs> coincidence that made me actually like really calm down after that, um, because it was well, like maybe you did. I don't know. If you I think mean, you did, then you probably did. You know, they weren't home. Uh, they weren't home. They were <laughs> on. They weren't on a home. They were on vacation. 
it was close to a lunar uh lunar cycle you know i can't remember if it was full or new um but uh you know in the bathtub with salt water with intention with breathing with a lot of things like it it really actually kind of scared me straight a bit and then soon after that like they basically got destroyed like i went to go offer them to somebody at the at the yoga studio i said hey brother like i think you should use these i've been using them for a while i've been having some crazy experiences in my room uh you know on my own with them like you know try them out he's like no no don't worry about it and i ended up leaving them on the top of my car um he was gonna buy some that's why he didn't want to do it he's like no i'm just gonna go buy some tonight and i was like okay great whatever um you don't want to use them you know i'm only slightly only a little <laughs> bit butthurt but it's okay and uh but it's kind of like that same thing where I've heard, like, you know, people say, like, you know, the, that it, once a crystal itself is done with you or, like, it's so full of, like, your energy that and it hasn't gotten uh, transmuted out or ha it'll, like, find a way away from you because there's so much of yeah. that energy stored. And if you don't take proper care of these tools or equipment, like, they're just as much living as you are in, in a sense that they'll try to literally leave you and say like, dude, come on, bro. Like, give me some space. Yeah. Everything is, everything is animated by the same self-existing life force intelligence that we are. So forks, crystals, like these are made of metal. Metal is one of the elements that it, it naturally comes about in our realm and it is in some form alive, just slower than we are. I think so. Um, I will say yes. on the note of buying forks, I reckon like the forks I use are from a website called the Omnivos, O-M-N-I-V-O-S. I like them a lot. I also hear good things about Medivibe, M-E-D-I-V-I-B-E, -E, Medivibe. And then, of course, the uh, Biofield Tuning Store, those are probably your top notch, top dollar forks that you can get. Um, they're my, in my experience, m the most durable and most clear tones, but you know, for starting out, if you want to get a full set, you can get like an Omnivo set of the self forks for like, a, I don't know, 150 bucks, maybe, mm. uh, maybe you get a better deal certain days, depending on what's up. So that's not bad for, I will say I've never tried to open portals with my forks. I've never played with them in the bath and I've only ever used them with the intention for like healing or balancing or harmonizing. So I, I guess I, that's outside of my wheelhouse in terms of uh, what happened with either Romy, but it was, it was irresponsible uh, to say the least. <laughs> are there, are there tuning forks with three prongs? Not that I know of. Oh, I see you. I see where you're asking there. Tuning Trident. That uh, could be a really fun cool invention, though. There's that other. That's, there's that weapon too that, uh, like Mardu holds. I forget what the fuck it's called. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's like a. It looks like a trident, but it's not. It's like a. And there's like a three prongs on both sides. So the guy that uh, makes these big ones, like the one I'm holding here. He makes like a Darth yeah. Maul version where it's du okay. double sided. Oh, There's a fork yeah. on both sides. And he does it so that one side that you're holding is the perfect fifth to the other side. That's mm. what I want next. A super shaman. Whoa. Yeah, that is super shaman. <laughs> I, see, I see big twirls happening in the future here. Oh, man. Big I'm twirly whirlies. <laughs> Okay, so let's continue, you know, so if anybody hadn't already yeah. started to k clue in to what makes a Solfeggio number, so let's examine the pattern of the traditional three by three grouping of nine digits like you would see on your phone if you were typing in a phone number. One, two, three in one row, four, five, six in one mm -hmm. row, seven, eight, nine in another row. Now let's look at those vertical columns and they create a trinity of trinities. These Three, th three sets of three numbers. These three digit groups create the nine numbers of Selfeggio. So that's 147 or 417 or 741. I'm sorry, 174 is one of them, 417 and 741. Why they are in the certain order that they're in, we'll get into that. But so three of the nine Selfeggios 
have the one, the seven, and the four grouped together. The others, the next three have the two, five, eight grouped together, and then the three, six, and nine grouped together. So that's part of, so that's the first thing that you can observe when you're thinking about the pattern of one, seven, four, two, eight, five, three, nine, six, four, one, seven, five, two, eight, six, three, nine, seven, four, one, eight, five, two, nine, six, three. Now, what's interesting is if you do some basic addition, and I, you know, if people don't like things being mathy, too bad, it's going to be a little bit mathy. If you add the digits in these three sets of Trinity, you will see more. So the 147 adds up to 12, the 258 adds up to 15, the 369 adds up to 18. Now, if we do a little theosophical reduction, the 12 becomes a three, mm -hmm. the 15 becomes a six, and the 18 becomes a nine. So we see a 369 pattern happening here. We see this every time we open our phone and we're going to call somebody and type in a number. This three by three grid. One, two, three, four, five, six, oh, seven, eight, nine. Oh, man. That's it. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just had like a, a. Yeah. 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 Keep going. Lay it on me, man. Lay it on me. What do you got? Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I feel like the. When I'm looking into like uh, new, numeral sim symbology or. or numerology and in, in this the symbols and numbers i'm like there's so much archetypes that go into each of these digits and um then looking at it through this lens is really interesting and grouping these three things together giving you uh giving you like a single archetype but like the trinity of that archetype and also they're interchangeable depending which, which reminds me a lot of like theologies and, and mythologies and astro theological stories is like the interchangeability of these certain players at a point how they might transmute into each other um and i like where your head's at man like one thing that i plan to do is get with gabriel and see how these numbers apply to the enneagram oh you know like what is what happens when you put a seven a four and one together in the of enneagram characters you know, That's he's a great got idea. mythological characters that correspond to the Enneagram and like angels and demons that go with each of the nine uh, of the Ennead, uh, ancient Egyptian Ennead. So I feel like there's probably a lot there. There might even be mythological stories that are derived from the Solfeggio Enneagram. Like I think this may be more ancient knowledge than we think. In the terms one of thing that really the special harmony between these sets of numbers because we're just kind of getting cooking here there's like a lot of weird number magic in these yeah. nine these nine digits it's it's true the one thing that really just got me on this one was like the one four seven because those grouping of three numbers are incredibly significant um and i don't know much about the two five and eight besides obvious you know that that oh goodness okay i need to just yeah. calm down but i want to say we'll get there set uh the septenary the monad and then the quadrant like the quadrivium the septenary the monad all being grouped together is really fucking cool because it is that oh my goodness so yes please keep going yeah it's so cool my dog was getting stoked on it <laughs> <laughs> good boy it's like yeah so exactly i like where your head's at because this is i think where we can reveal some of the more of the wisdom of these groupings so the uh one seven one, four, and seven, in my opinion, represents the tr first trinity the th or represents three because, you know, they one, four, and seven add together gives you 12, which reduces to three. The trinity is called the three and one is a concept found in all spiritual systems. You have Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. You have God, Jesus, Holy Ghost. You have uh, Noah's three sons, Ham, Japheth, and... Uh, well, who's the other one? Shem, <laughs> you know, it goes yeah, like yeah. Th this Trinity is over and over. And there's a lot more as like in terms of mythology and sky clock stuff about the Trinity without mm -hmm. getting into the weeds and that. But what is important is that the four numbers, four and seven also encode the three and one and why that is doing this theosophical reduction. Um, I guess I used that phrase incorrectly just earlier. So what, what that process is really so sorry myself now the process of adding all the integers that up a number is called theosophical reduction so pythagoras was all about this 
Tetractus was was all about this, his uh his special triangle. So if you take the four and you one plus two plus three plus four, all the digits that become four, uh you get ten. They add up to ten. Ten is a one. So if you do this with seven, you go one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven. It equals twenty-eight. Two plus eight is a ten. There's your one again. If you can, mm-hmm. you know, if you continue down the line, actually, so obviously, so you have one does that one is one, four becomes one with this theosophical reduction, seven becomes a one, ten is one, mm-hmm. and if you keep going, it actually continues for ad infinitum. Every three numbers, yes, in in the number line to infinity <laughs> becomes one. I call this the regenerating trinity. What we call numbers are an endlessly regenerating trinity. So basically when you're counting, you could say that you're counting 1, 2, 3, 1, 5, 6, 1, and 1, 11, 12, 1, 14, 15, 1, 17, 18, 1, 20, 21, 1. Because 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, 19, 22, all reduced to 1. Ad infinitum, it never ends through this process. Every third number in the number line reduces to one. Every third number returns to oneness and kicks off the trinity it's like, it's again. Like a it's chain uh, link. Kind of wild. A continuous genetic chain information memory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's oh. pretty fun math. Um, so I look at them like <laughs> I, I definitely look at the 174. 417 and uh, 741, those three Solfeggio numbers that use those three digits, as a, but basically, you know, if we're going to give them an esoteric correlation, it's the feeling of wholeness, oneness, monad, like, and that applies to the four and the seven as much as the number one. That's really cool. Wow. And uh, <laughs> so there's definitely, so like, w- w- this set of numbers is special just based on that alone. Like yeah. did whoever came up with this, I have no idea who first put these numbers together this way. I think this is just human intuitive human knowledge that maybe crops up again now and again. I, I didn't find this anywhere um, in terms of an explanation for self though. This is like what I kind of think is going on because no matter what <laughs> yeah, you're reducing back down to a, a three if you combine, you know, three numbers that all reduce to one, it's uh, it's weird. But the best way I can explain this in simple, simple, simple terms is that, you know, we have endless numbers, one to infinity, mm-hmm. nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. You know, one to nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. But in a way, all of that is repeating the nine integers, one through nine. And in a way, in integers of one through nine are actually just repeating one, two, three. So there's like the Trinity is like this inherent. The, I think it's like the fir- other than one itself, oneness itself, this Trinity is at the core and base. You can reduce everything down to it, you mm-hmm. know, where everything it, reducing is maybe the wrong word. Everything's built out of it. Trinity's everywhere. It's like the roots, man, because like this, so this is ringing so much to music theory and music theory is absolutely built off of this. I mean, this is the explanation, the true roots of music theory. This is exactly what it is. And like this screen right here, when you look at, so there were seven notes, seven main whole notes in the scale and whatever scale that is. And music uh, notes go through A through G, which is the first seven letters. And you need three notes to make a chord. And a chord is a perfect harmonized sound. And that's what, in music theory, makes a chord. You can't hold um, a, a G and an F sharp, and it's not a chord, right? Technically, it's a semitone. But you need, a, you need the third one to make it a note. And so, yeah, this is blowing my mind, but it's also making a lot of sense. And I've never put these like kind of like two things together. But the patterns are there. And it's a cycle, like a cyclic pattern. And that one right there, we just showed, it's just like, 
those must be like the that must be the perfect chord like jazz chord progression i'm thinking is like you do the one to the four to the seven uh which you like i guess if you okay and then you always go back to the fifth the perfect fifth which is i don't know it's just blowing my mind dude it's just blowing my mind i'm mind blown i gotta clean up my brains <laughs> someone clean up my brain for me. <laughs> i uh i feel like you know if it's okay we'll just take a little detour to looking at the uh how this concept is was looked at in the uh, occult world of the idea of the yadhe vavhe oh the name the four letter name of god mhm i like this so uh it's a little blurry but you have here can you see Pentagrams. Pentagrams. Solomonic magic. Oh, these aren't Solomonic pentagrams, magic. dog. Those aren't pentagrams. Those oh, are six pentacles. pointed. Pentacles. Pentacles yeah. is what I meant to say. Pentacles. That's not a pen. It's not. No, they're it's six. Six, baby. It's the hex, baby. <laughs> Whenever wrap it in so, a circle. Basically, I mean, I'm going to like really condense this down, <laughs> but this is an ancient diagram of the yod he vav he, where the yod is. Okay, so everyone's familiar with the six-pointed star, the upward-facing triangle and the downward-facing triangle. The odd uh, would be, okay, so three of these and then a fourth that's just the positive triangle. This is uh, an attempt to demonstrate what the, uh, the, re- the building and the regenerating of the world <laughs> is doing numerically. Um, why 22 is the master builder number, why a lot of ancient alphabets stopped at 22, um, Mm -hmm. maybe, allegedly. So if you were counting um, the first, so the first six points, the first seven points of the first septenary of, you know, Yod at the top here, you're making an upward facing triangle where one, two, three, are the corners of the upward facing triangle four, five, six are the corners of the downward facing triangle. And then seven is in the middle, the, the point in the middle. And then on the hay, the first hay, the seven becomes the top point of the upward facing triangle. And then the eight, nine are the bottom corners. And then 10, 11, 12 make the downward facing triangle 13 in the middle. And it goes on in this pattern where the Vav now begins with 13 as the top point, uh, goes around the horn again and 19 in the middle. So you're seeing like, are you seeing the very occult significance of some of the, like the numbers that wind up in the middle, seven, 13, 19, <laughs> you know? Um, and then the, uh, the last hay, the fourth hay is incomplete because as the, uh, you get to 21 and the 22nd number would be the beginning of the downward facing triangle Mm -hmm. that actually becomes according to the, like, you know, Pythagoreans, the 22 becomes the number one of the next cycle, Mm -hmm. the next world, the world is renovated and started over. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, you can look at that as the symbolic of the great cycle of the, the great year, um, looking at how in the tarot, the fool card is either number one or either number zero or number 22 or, or whatever. Um, it's kind of the first card or the last card. I could be mm-hmm. mixing it up numerically, but anyway, that's a little detour. That was not part of the plan like, to talk about, but <laughs> I, like I learned that. about that from Dylan Sicosio's book, um, J- July's End with Black Swans, which I also narrated as an audiobook. So go check that out. Oh, nice. It's a really, really good occult work of art on all kinds of awesome symbolic gravy that will totally upgrade your literacy in all these areas. If you go check it out, please do. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Should I, do you want me to bring that back up? Do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah. I mean, cool. I, I like it. The, the one thing it's really cool. Um, and it's super fractal. It's explaining fractal, sacred geometry, the number and the cymatics and the resonance and the frequencies and all of the beautiful things. Um, and, the cosmic code really like because that's what deep esoteric and occult knowledge is is understanding these deep cosmic codes and the celestial cycles that happen and once we're in tune with that once we understand that then we can start to you know really get to grasp and grasp control but one the one thing about this 
the way we went through all of these Star of Davids, and I brought up Pentacles earlier, in the Lesser Key of Solomon, he calls all of the shapes that are encircled within the magic circle that aren't just, you know, like they're seven pointed stars, eight pointed stars. He just calls them pentacles. So, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know. Okay, Roman's right. Okay. You know what? <laughs> How Listen, dare you? Stroke ego. Stroke Listen. ego. Stroke so, ego. Stroke hey. ego. Hey, so, I'm, this is just, it's, it's hitting home. <laughs> it is hitting home. I just got done reading the books like a couple days ago. So um, I was really excited that you brought this up, actually. <laughs> and uh, the, you know, the Star David is super deep, David, you know, David being Solomon's father and, and all these things. Yeah, and, and so looking at, looking at this image, um, so how, you see how it stops at 22, and the Stars of David's are actually seven-pointed because there's a point in the middle, and that encodes the one of the most important transcendentals that ever was, which is pi. 22 divided by seven gives you 3.14. It's the only, yes. it's the closest approximation to pi you can make out of whole numbers. Man. And, uh, and now, the, you know, Pythagoreans were pretty into pi, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> pretty into pi. One thing, well, the one thing that about this that reminded me of, uh, which we were talking about just the other day is, that 22, the reason why that last last one isn't finished or started over is because that last, the 22 is like the 13, the 13th sign, the 13th hidden sign in the Zodiac. Everyone's like, there's supposed to be a 13th sign. It was removed. But it's almost like, no, that 13th sign is the hidden sign because it starts the next cycle on which the fractal begins to expand. That's what it reminds me of. The 22 is like the 13th yeah, like an octave. sign. Like an octave. So like Ophiuchus steps up to the next step. You've done the full motion of taking a step. Now you're walking up the stairs. That's what this reminds me of. The 13th hidden sign of, of the Zodiac isn't supposed to be on there. It's that step, the hop up to the next octave. I fucking love that. That's kind of what it painted. Yeah, and just like try to divide a circle. Try to divide a circle into 12 sections. And then try to divide a circle into 13 sections. <laughs> Tell me how long it takes for each one. There's a, there's a really obvious, simple reason why you have 12 signs in the Zodiac and not 13. <laughs> uh, I, I do not consider, you know, Ophiuchus to be like, they kept it from us. You know, I mean, it's it, all the constellations are important and they encode a lot of great things to know. And, you know, that's a whole nother story, but... <laughs> Yeah, there's. I, I think it. it's very, very re reasonable to have twelve signs of your zodiac, and for the thirteenth step, to either be the middle, like you in the center, twelve around one, or to be your um, next octave, like you said, uh, either or kind of will fit. But yeah, let's continue walking through the selfeggio. I'm, I'm really enjoying the detours, though. Thanks for indulging. We want to look yeah, at the. It uh, goes into. Uh... It goes into the tribe of Dan too, and how they're the thirteenth tribe of Israel, and how the twelve oh. tribes re uh, relate to the zodiac, and the thirteenth tribe, which is Dan, is also uh, could be considered Ophiuchus, and how I usually think they're outside of the perimeter. But if you look at that, then they would be within it, and they're judging all the rest. They're the central wheel. They're the Oof. axis, baby. That's that good. Yeah, that goes deep, axle. man. That goes deep. Beautiful. So we're going to look now at the 258 as the next step of our regenerating trinity. So that's going to cover off the uh, tones that are 852, um, you know, 528 and 285. I almost forgot the 285, like <laughs> which one it was because I never use it, but these numbers, in my opinion, are like representative of the divine union of two sets of oneness as the six, meaning like a three, which is a, a full being, a trinity, and a three coming together equals six. And you know, maybe that's why six sounds like sex. Two plus five plus eight equals 15, which equals six, if that wasn't evident. So these digits, I think, this is just my opinion, having used them, are like the balancing point or the mirroring of the wholeness of the one, like mother and father, God and goddess, that type of ideal, male and female. And, you know, thinking about it now, 
as well. The uh, 5, 2, 8, and the 7, 4, not, not 7, 4, 1, the 8, 5, 2, uh, and especially like, okay, so if you were correlating the 5, 2, 8 to the solar plexus, as I like to use it, uh, most of the organs that that region governs, not all, but a lot of them, I'm really thinking about the um, like lungs and the kidneys and things in the chest. There's a lot of mirroring, like one on the left, one on the right. Mm. And the 852 being your uh, third eye mm -hmm. is also your brain has a left and right side, a male and female side. You know, there could be something to that. If you're correlating yeah. the 285 to like the legs or the ankles or the knees, there's a left leg and a right leg. So, you know, I'm not saying that that's like a 100% lock type of correlation, but it's interesting. Yeah, I, I um, dig it, man. Two because... is the one mirroring itself. It's the monad becoming the duad. Yeah. Five is the five is the balancing point between one through nine. Like, look at the symbol mm -hmm. of phi in the Greek alphabet. It's a circle with a line through the middle. And it's the root of our word five. The phi ratio is found mm -hmm. throughout how nature builds things, how Truth. nature generates things. So that's interesting as well. And then eight, the infinity symbol turned Balance, sideways yeah. is two circles side by side. I so love it. It is like, holy shit. You know, it's a circle. It's a monad. So I think this two, five, eight is telling us something about the, uh, it's also eight is two of the number four, you know, two stabilities together. Mm -hmm. So I think this two, five, eight, is telling us something about the relationship of like mirroring and one way you might use self edgio tones for that are two, five, eight or five or uh, five, two, eight or eight, five, two. I'm sorry. Two eighty five is the right one. Anyway, <laughs> one way that you would use those maybe would be to help you bring balance between your left and right side or your masculine feminine, mm -hmm. your, your yin and yang. Yeah. Uh, I think that that would be a good way to do it. Dude, I, you're, totally totally that's that? absolutely i mean like i love the eight too because the way you draw a circle you have to have i mean it's two of four right it's completely the hermetic number eight is like there's your reason why it's like eastern mystic or like the eight legged horse of odin you know right like eight is infinity for a reason because one two three four being <clears throat> the four winds or what have you that's how you draw a circle and then you put those two circles together and you have that that perfect perfect vesca pisces man and yeah everything in this is about balance this is balance i <laughs> two five eight eight five two five two eight it has to be the balancing and it's funny that's right in the middle of the three different uh triads that are there it, it totally every <laughs> i love it i love breaking down this the numbers like this dude it's it just it's such a perfect cipher and it's so ancient so simple but like so simply mind blowing, dude. Oh my goodness. It's on our hands. <laughs> you know, we got the digits on our hands. Uh, I'll continue forward here. You know, get us to this infographic. We're kind of long in the recording here. So I'll try to maybe not rush, but like get us there. Um, so finally, we reach the three, six, and nine the birth of the divine child. Two trinities have come together, three plus three, to make six or sex, and they generate the third trinity of nine, the divine child. Three plus six plus nine equals 18. 18 is one plus eight, which equals nine. 18 is the idea of when the child is just like become an adult. Nine is a trinity of trinities, mother, father, child. So they represent three, six, and nine, the culmination of the generative principle. A child just dates in the womb for nine months. There's something there for sure. So, you know, that's what I think the basics is here symbolically. Uh, moving forward, we can also encode, find some other things encoded in the word selfeggio, like soul, fe, egg, io, and there's a lot more, but just for a little bit, soul, S-O-L, is the soul, your soul, and also the sun, S-U-N, or son, S-O-N of God. Soul is the alone one, solo, solus. And uh, there's also fe, so there's one right there. <laughs> fe, I don't know a lot about fe as a word, but, you know, there's the fe folk, the other side the, of our reality potentially going back. So if we're going from like a three, six, nine idea here, soul being the three or the one, 
the monad, Faye being the other side of the mirror world, the, the Mary, the, the feminine, the mother, you know, the Faye folk. <laughs> and then egg, but also Faye means trust in a lot of languages like Latin. I don't know, I don't know what else to say about that, but egg is the symbol of generation. It's where the child is at. It's the created universe. Soul Faye, egg. Pope hat. <laughs> and when you egg somebody on, it could mean to encourage them. Uh, and then you have the IO in Solfeggio. IO or YO is 10. It's also one of the names of God in the ancient world. YO, YA, YAO, one of the many names and was represented as a one and a zero or an I and an O, IOTA, Omicron in many languages and many versions of symbolism. IO, YO is God. Um, and that's because it's the phallus and yoni, the pole and the hole, the generative mm. organs of biology. And like I said, like words such as Yah, you, Jew, um, Jehovah, these are derivatives of not just yo, but the number 10. And there's so much more in that. The sun, S-U-N slash S-O-N of God being represented by 10. It's why you get the cross or the X on your head at Ash Wednesday if you're a Catholic. That's actually the number 10. The fly. <laughs> People, the Jotun. Yeah, pe the Jotun. And um, the Tav is also a similar version of that. Thor's hammer. Uh, a lot of stuff with the 10. It goes on. We, we, can, we could unpack that in future conversations maybe. And uh, I just, you know, there's... To skip, I want to skip forward, though, because I made this infographic, infographic a little maybe too meaty. And I want to look, look at the addition and subtraction of the 369 pattern that endlessly repeats in Solfeggio. Yes. What I find interesting about this is every number in the sequence creates a three when subtracted from the, when the previous number Whoa. is subtracted from it. Looks like I have a typo there. And the result is reduced through addition. So if you take the 963 and then the one right under that, 852, minus 963 minus 852, you get 111. 852 minus 741, you get 111. And so this goes on. You're either going to get, through, through this subtraction, you're either going to get 111 or 102 or 21. But either way, it's always a three. One step to the next step is always a differential of three when you reduce. And then in the same sense, if you add any two tang tangential self geo numbers, you either get a three, six, or nine when you apply that same additive reduction to the resulting sum. So this gets very mathy and we won't like go over it too hard other than to say that like, if you look at the redu reduced sum of all the self edge numbers from one, seven, four plus two, eight, five, all the way till you get to eight, five, two plus nine, six, three, the pattern that you get is nine, six, three, nine, six, three, nine, six. So that goes on. Um, so no matter how you add or subtract yes. any self edge numbers, the result will always return to three, six, and nine, to put it simple. And if you continue this exploration, you're subtracting numbers that are uh, a step, two steps away, two steps away instead of one, like nine, six, three, minus seven, four, one, you get two, 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 <laughs> six, three, nine, minus four, one, seven, you get two, two, two. <laughs> Nine six three six nine minus one seven four. You get two two two. Those are all sixes. And if you go a further step, so you're doing nine six three minus six three nine, you get three twenty four, which is a nine. And if you do that again on the next one, the next rung down, you get a three two four again, and a three two four again. So no matter how you slice it, adding and subtracting any of these two numbers together gives you three sixes and nines, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> so like that to me is. There's some magic in that sequence. Yes, man. There's something truly special about that. And you can kind of look at that as a, you can look at the rows and columns on a three by three grid and do the same thing. You know, if you're adding, if you're adding three Solfeggio numbers that are in a row or column together, it's always giving you a nine. So you could go on with that additions and subtractions. I've even played with multiplications, ad infinitum. It's three, six, and nine forever and ever. There's the pattern. <laughs> so I think it's likely that the coherence of this num number sequence truly does activate the natural regenerative potential of the body because this is the pattern of nature itself in terms of generation. This is the generative principle 
-hmm. in the, in the language of nature that we've abstractified into a you know glyphs and symbols but this is what this is electricity <sighs> this is life force this is what life force does yes man so you mind I definitely going back encourage people to play with those in, numbers. And do you mind going back up to the ad infinitum? Just scrolling up just a little bit. I need to take a screenshot. Okay. You, do you want the, the do you regeneration? Want the grid or do you want this part? Uh, right there. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Right there. Yes. So I, so I thought it would be fun here to also play a couple of them. Like I mentioned, these subtractive and additive differentials and sums that made one one ones and two two twos, and I think that's really cool. And I thought it might be fun to play some forks at the same time as each other, so everyone can maybe feel um, yes. how how these playing off of each other feels because it's pretty cool. And certain ones have a better, stronger feeling together than others, in my opinion. So well, I'm going to do two, two. I'm going to do four, one, seven, and five, two, eight together, and then I'm going to do another set of three of them at the same time, just so you guys can hear that. I think five two eight and four one seven sound great together. Hold Dan, on for a second, What's you that? said that the three six nine that the, they're representative of mother, father, child. Yeah, I th well, three being the father, six being the mother, nine being the child. This is all. This then, is just my idea. And I'm then not that's, saying uh, this is gospel. No, no, no. But that's regeneration, and that's also a, a generation. Each each mother uh and child is a, a new generation do you think is that where we got the word uh generation from is from from this pattern well where the word generation comes from is another story that i wouldn't be able to answer but like the idea <laughs> of it <laughs> the idea of it is yeah like back when i showed you those um when i showed you those i showed you that yod hey vav hey right yeah. how the 22 becomes the one of the next cycle that's yeah, yeah. just like your son becomes the father the father is the son you know yeah whenever he has his children this is what nature does it's like this crazy on life just goes on i think the meaning of life is life baby i think the point of life is to go on <laughs> think existence is here to exist and we do, we're doing it yeah i agree i think it's beautiful the point of life is life exactly it doesn't need to be more complicated than that mm -hmm. <laughs> well this this just presentation thing. it's itself awesome <laughs> just shows live, us living l-i-v-i-n bro you've broken this down beautifully and i i think you do a great job of describing this and like you know like this just shows us that like it once you break down everything within you know that 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 10 digit everything through nine when you break it all down and you put it like this and then you put tones and frequencies onto it. Like it just shows us the interconnectedness of everything about how everything can transmute into everything else. And it goes through these different cycles as you work your way through um, these patterns. And like this, this really is a beautiful reminder of how simple things are. I, I really, really, really appreciate that presentation and yeah. the way you flow through that, man. Oh, thanks, dude. I, I like to visit this material and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it in, in depth and really showcase the ideas here. And uh, the conversation has given me a lot of glimpses at further directions I can take the investigation, which I appreciate too. Um, so yeah, let's, it would be fun to, we're probably near the end here, but it'd be fun to play some of these combinations. So when I play this 417 mm -hmm. and 528, together i want you to like feel into your dantian oh. like your your belly in the middle of your chest together and you know send energy okay. to this part of you that sound good mm -hmm. Yeah, so 417 and 528 sound really good together. 
something special about that combination. Uh, now I'm going to yeah. play. Uh, <laughs> feel great, dude. <laughs> and now I'm going to play a couple of, uh, I'm going to play 741. No, I'm going to play 639, 852, and 963. Those ones go awesome together. So it's like heart, third eye, crown. And uh, just, you know, sit back and enjoy this. It's a little tricky to do on a Zoom. <laughs> but hopefully that came through a little bit. You know, those three just it's like music, the simplest, most beautiful music. I'm gonna I'm gonna do them all one more time. Makes me think of choirs. Yeah, man. <sighs> the importance, the importance <laughs> the of harmony, community. You know. Yeah. Feels good, man. <laughs> and like, uh, you know, which uh, makes Dude, me pass it think, over here. Think of uh, like, <laughs> like my mom used to be into. And she still is, but for a long time, it took me, uh, it took me a while to like get into like being like, okay, like I'll give numerology a try. Like, how can you put, put this complex person down to one singular number and say that this person resonates with this one number and has that archetype of that one number. But, you know, um, after kind of going through like this presentation with you and like this stuff, it, it kind of makes you see the significance of resonating with that one number because once you start to dignify that number that resonates with you that tone that resonates with you it shows you the importance you play when you pair with other people when you start to resonate with other people and like you are beautiful on your own like each one of those forks is great on its own but when you pair them together it really like to me it's it spoke to community it like showed me the importance of like how how great it is to come together and to all sing our sing our voices and our thoughts and opinions and Amazing. resonate together mm -hmm. you know like super like th this three is, is a magic number wow boy <laughs> jelly in my bones over here man i i feel like we got a full session we just got a free session dan uh <laughs> Chance, uh, what's your Venmo, dude? I feel like I, I do have free. I've got dollars. some free tunings. I've got at least one or two out there that if people dig around on my channel or, or send me an email and ask for it, I can share. I have done, you know, group tunings before. I'm probably will again uh, somewhere in December, actually. Oh, sweet. So I free, hope that people gifts. follow my channel and check that out. Or, Yeah. And... You know, if people also interesting thing, too, is how this transcends space and time that when uh, people do sessions with me, I send them the recording. It doesn't even matter how well the recording captures the tones. It's still people say hey, anyway is effective to, to replay if they need to, like, uh, sh you know, rebalance energy that gets off. That is something we worked on in the session. I don't know, but. I'm happy to be of service in whatever way I can. And this is the method that most jumped out to me and felt like what I was called for. And it's also more important to me to see more people pick up 
the tuning forks and use them to learn how to make their body and their themselves the instrument like we talked about with the I, with the uh, dowsing rods becoming the dowsing rods I want more I want more than me tuning a lot of people I would rather there was a lot of people tuning a lot of people <laughs> that's really what I want so I hope this conversation maybe gets people exploring with tuning forks there's not really a wrong way to do it unless you're roman and you burn down your neighbor's house and other than that <laughs> it's pretty safe <laughs> oh see i didn't want to tell that story on the air but like i had already kind of told it before so i'm glad you did dude up. it's yeah. like really making me wonder what all is possible i think dude, anything dude, you, i think it's just, deep these things happen you didn't know how He's powerful you were wizard. it's all good i but we're all you're powerful and this you're is powerful all dude, this man. is all this is all like this is all the I think right here, I think everything we just talked about tonight is literally roots of the absolute optimized occult powers. I really do. I think this is what the ancient Masons were really tapping into, like this this sacred numerology that Pythagoras it's explained. the universal code. I think so. I really think so. Yeah. So let us fucking, let us resonate on this and like bond together and like we are going to, because our community of <laughs> podcasts and everything, like we are already cracking major codes. Like we are doing some like crazy the three of us. things. Like the three of us right now. Like we're all touching, like it kind of like, I'm like, like I'm almost grazing Chance's face here, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's insane. It's insane. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're on our way out here. Uh, Dan, what, what do you got to say to this fine gentleman who came and blessed us this evening? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chance. It's been a while since I've talked to you last, so it was great to see you again and have a conversation with you, buddy. Yeah, dude, uh, when we get into numbers and everything and how they break down, it, it evident that it, it, it just shows you what nature is operating on and by tapping into those you can uh the magicians of the world were also tapping into those things to use nature to their benefit i think some people even today are still doing those same things even for nefarious reasons or good reasons mm -hmm. you know I, I think you can do it either way and we talked about that too with your intention where do you set your attention at to get your uh desires out of using uh these codes so it's a very powerful tool i think that's why it's only for the secret societies because in the hands of many it could be an absolute fucking traumatic type of thing for the world if everybody's fucking around with tuning forks <laughs> right <Roman. laughs> you know i uh as funny as that story is, I would <laughs> it would take a lot to convince me that it's actually risky <laughs> to play with tuning forks. I mean, all I all I imagine what happened was Romy was sitting in his bathtub, like, you know, fuck those neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. No, but really yeah. though, uh, I think that it's fair. Like, it is. It's very. It's very much more magical world and not um like the more that i deeply go into all the things the more i see that most of the things to be a fear like uh, afraid of or worried about or like that the days could do or that the masses could fuck up the more like the, the more i go into it the more i see that like that's really all hype that the majority mm -hmm. i'm not saying that there's never wrongdoers in the world but to me, mm -hmm. like I'm starting to see that, of course, with the divine order and harmony of this number pattern that we talked about today, revealing to anybody with the eyes to see and the ears to hear that this is a creation or a construct or in some way divinely ordered and yes. not just random, pointless chaos, then, you know, I think that we also have to. I think the logical place to go from there is to realize that everything is part of that order. Everything is part of, you could say God's plan. If you want to use those words that the, like the most satanic for lack of a better label, the most satanic perspective is the one that says, I shouldn't be here. This should never have happened to me. 
I'm a victim of these circumstances. Like <laughs> victim mentality. I learned this from Owen Benjamin on one of the streams just today. Like he put it so, so well. And I was like, that's it. That resonates so well that as soon, like, as soon as you enter into the contract of victim consciousness in any way, that is the opposite of, oh. you know, oh, being so saved toxic. or being it's, Christian it feels, or being good. Like, it feels dude, gross. It's just, victim consciousness is oh, Satanism. God, you know, it's the same off, thing. Oh, God, it's so real. Yeah, so I'm not accusing Dan of that. I'm just – or anything from what you no, just said. I just want to, like, really oh. leave people with that message that, no. you know, don't worry about what the they's are doing. Don't worry about the – what could go wrong? I mean, be rational. If your body gives you fear signals, then like hold up and try to figure that out and don't just be reckless. But overall, like <clears throat> the wrong thing can't happen to you. Yeah. Even your experiences that were traumatic or, or put, you know, off balance energy in your field that could be harmonized, all that, like even the worst thing that ever happened to you, it also is an opportunity to help other people that have had something similar happen to them if you work through it and find your wholeness that you never lost, that you just sort of hid from yourself. And there's, yeah, there's, there's nothing but the good. There's nothing but light. There's nothing but <laughs> love and truth and everything else is, uh, is fiction. We can well, get really influenced by the fiction. We can really believe it. We can suspend our disbelief and, you know, I'm not like, like people will get upset about this perspective and be like, how dare you say that it's divine order when like the predator shreds the prey or like that someone got raped. But at the end of the day, I don't think that there's anything but free will. And maybe that free will extends beyond our ability to perceive where we're at in this current life and in this incarnation. But at some level, because the life force energy of all of us is indivisible and one then the divine will and the divine order was, you know, free, your free will is the will of creation. And it doesn't mean it's no justification to be a shithead or anything, you know, but uh, sinful behavior, so to speak, is its own punishment as going against things, yeah. doing things the way nature would do them. You will have consequences that are pretty immediate. Uh, you know, no, well, like it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. Let's all just like, let's all crush and have an awesome time and not be victim. Yeah. When, when I said that, I didn't mean like, um, you know, reptilians are ruling the world and controlling the world through codes and blah, blah, blah. I just meant like individuals are able to use these, mm -hmm. uh, there might even be reptilians out there, to, you know, but like, God <laughs> Just one. I think a lot of it is, is the consistency, man. Like consistency, if like no matter what, like these, like tapping into a pathway, like a resonant pathway, a tone or frequency, whatever, you have to be consistent with it. Because even if you get hit with it for a second, your body transmutes it and then you're back on the path that you're already on. But I think what what it is, is like they need to be so consistently negative. They need to in install so many of these things consistently. Hence media and other forms of like control is like a super consistent like when someone sells you something like having have worked unfortunately work telemarketing they're like you don't get off that in call until you sell that and so you just caught you have to be constant until the person breaks down and they say i'll take it whatever and then they're now the victim of your sales so like this whole victim responsibility actually is a huge thing but what i think it is is like it's not it's not the right way. It is not the. I do think this whole free will conversation is very, very introspective, very deep, um, especially as an outro segue. But what I think a lot of the negative, shadowy things are myself personally is just like they're they have such they have such um, large amount of time and free responsibility that they're able to penetrate us with constant negative, um, though there are constant positives. Uh, but the, the negatives is like, it's so much uh, easier to see the, the shadow sometimes because it's, it's that opposition to, to the light there. So you, you see it, you see it, see it. And then your eyes just keep going to the shadowy things. And yeah, it's, a, it's an incredibly deep construct. And I just had to get my little two cents in there. But the consistency thing of the, the pathways, man. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it.
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys, too. I really had fun. I would love to come back anytime. Well, I'm sure we'll continue to collaborate in different ways. For sure, man. For sure. Thank you again, Chance. Uh, yes. Sir. Plug your shit, man. Oh, yeah. Interversepodcast.com. And now there's interversemerch.com. I will be adding to that as I go. Nice. My YouTube or my Rockfin are a good way to keep up with the show, but the podcast is on anything that podcasts are on. And yeah, like there's just so much gravy on there. It's hard to get into, but I'm really proud of the uh, collaborations I've done with my buddy Dylan Sakoshio and also a pretty recent episode called Heaven is the Sky about the celestial code and, oh, uh, nice. you know, the, the language of the stars. Uh, you know, I'm starting to kind of break into on my own channel, maybe doing more solo presentations of my own research. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm enjoying that a lot. So please come follow my shit. There's like, it's my last <laughs> work. I love it. I Hit think it you'll up. love it too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, man. Of course, and, brother. And Fire Tribe, thank you for listening. And if you're not down with that, wake up.